my final question to you is time horizon for this trade. As I look out the next five to 10 years, this is a difficult call, but it looks like trend growth is lower. That means interest rates will also likely be lower. Our tolerance for higher rates has clearly diminished because we've added so much debt to this economy. Over the long term, do you see that as an environment where banks can have this durable outperformance over a long period of time? Or is this an 18-month, 12-month, two-quarter trade? What is it, Miss Slav? In my view, it's not five to 10 years. This is not a regime shift, but this is 2016, 2017 type of a three to four quarters trade. Okay. Like then, you had a crash and, and you have a stimulus and a reacceleration. So it's going to be a meaningful trade. Ms. Love, appreciate it. Appreciate the clarity there as well. Good luck over the next couple of days to you and the team over at JP Morgan. Great work on this note. Fantastic read. I want to get back to the market desk on this market. We do advance with your movers. Here's Abigail. John, let's keep it super simple relative to the S&P 500 at least and take a look at the two biggest point boosts and the two biggest movers. As for the point boost, not surprisingly, it's tech. Those stocks that were so beaten down last week, we have buyers out. Both Apple and Microsoft being bid up, investors buying the dip after last week's disappointment around less than perfect earnings. As for the biggest percentage movers and the reason Nielsen uh, up about 7%, the reason that the industrial sector is uh, close to the top, they put up a strong quarter, but they also are selling their global connect business to Advent for $2.7 billion. So again, that's the best stock within the industrial sector. And then Estee Lauder, the second best stock for the S&P 500 or right around there, they put up a strong quarter going into the holiday season. Investors liking it, really buying last week's dip right across the board at this point, John. Abigail, thank you. Coming up on this program, if you're a journalist and you could design a trading week and you got three picks, a political event, a central bank decision, and a data point, it would be this week right here. Coming up this week, a contentious battle for the White House, a Federal Reserve decision, and payrolls Friday. That conversation up next with Academy's Peter Cheer From London and New York, this is Bloomberg. That's debatable, an interactive series on today's most pressing issues. The resolution this time, is a U.S.-China space race good for humanity? We'll hear from both sides. The competition, if you look at the past, led to innovation. A whole new arms race could start. And we'll get your perspective, too, with help from the artificial intelligence of IBM Watson. I'm John Donvan. Join us for That's Debatable, presented by Bloomberg and Intelligence Squared, Friday on Bloomberg Television.
the market is still worried about uncertainty over next week's election, uncertainty over the rising coronavirus, and potential of more fiscal stimulus and or inflation. So all of that is more than offsetting a giant buy for the bonds from the Fed and what should be chasing people into it. Instead, they're looking at this news and selling it off. Really great to catch up with Bianco Research President Jim Bianco. Weighing in on the big market moving events this week, and what a week. A crucial stretch for investors. With the week ahead, Bloomberg's Michael McKee joins us now. Hey, Mike. Good morning, John. Well, it's the first of the month, so that means PMI Day around the world. China still expanding, and a host of good numbers out of Europe this morning, but maybe a last stand as they begin to lock down. We just got the market PMI for the United States. Comes in at 53.4. That's just a tenth higher, not statistically significant, but it suggests the manufacturing economy is still growing, at least as we head into higher COVID cases. Now, the number of the day is the ISM comes up at the top of the hour. Improvement expected there as well. Tomorrow, of course, eh, nothing's happening. Uh, the question is, will tomorrow linger for the rest of the week and overhang everything else we do? Will we know what's happened in the election by the time the Fed meets on Thursday? Wednesday is the start of the Fed meeting. We get the ADP report as well that day. Uh, always traded, not always very accurate in terms of the payrolls number. But Thursday is the Fed and the Bank of England. They have the same problem. No visibility out there. Not only do we not know who's going to be president, but we don't know what the virus caseload is going to be like in the months ahead. We have an idea of what will happened because of the lockdowns in the UK. Is that ahead for the US and for the Bank of England, of course, not just uh, the virus, but uh, wither Brexit. Uh, Friday, the question is, will the jobs report be a key question or will we only be talking about the presidential results? As of today, economists say we should see about 700,000 jobs created in October, another slowdown. But if there is good news out there for President Trump, it's in the conference board. Uh, consumer confidence figures from last week that showed Americans think there is a rising possibility of more jobs being available. So one good mark for the president as he campaigns. But again, Friday, a long way away, John. A lifetime away. Michael McKee, that's a quote. Always traded, not accurate. That's Michael McKee throwing some shade at traders, as he often does. You've got to listen carefully. But every now and again... He'll just throw a little bit of shade at you out there. Mike, thank you. Peter Cheer of Academy Securities saying any outcome on Election Day is still better than the current uncertainty. He writes the following. Markets will have to digest the election and determine what the results mean, but that should be a far easier task than currently having to assume almost any possible scenario could happen. The Fed will remain agnostic to the election. Peter joins us now over the phone. Peter Cheer, fantastic to catch up with you, sir. Just give me your guide, your playbook for the next several days. You know, I think we want to see what happens with the election, and from there we'll be able to make decisions on what should happen next. I think really for the markets over the coming weeks, it's really going to be about stimulus. Does anything happen to the election that changes the course of stimulus? And if it doesn't, I think markets can rebound pretty nicely because stimulus does look like it's coming. And then as we've seen before time and time again, politicians almost need their feet held to the fire to do something in terms of stimulus. With COVID cases rising, Europe deteriorating, and possibly weaker job data coming in, I think we are going to get that stimulus. Well, Peter, you had the confidence to come out in April time and talk about leaning into cyclical risk, leaning into risk, risk assets. Well, the world effectively was shut down, Peter. Now we're starting to see Europe effectively go into lockdown. Different to spring, but still nevertheless not what we hoped for in the summer looking out to 21 and looking to the back end of 20. Are you willing to do the same thing again, Peter? Yes, I still like the cyclicals. I think we are going to really get stimulus, and it's going to be more than the Band-Aid stimulus. We're going to see some infrastructure spending, and we're going to see things that can kind of really boost the economy. And valuations are still quite low for a lot of these stocks. So I think that's where the opportunity is. And we've seen it for the past few weeks where you've really seen, say, the Russell 2000 and some value stocks actually outperform big tech. It's not happening today, but I think that is a trend that's in place, especially as we march to slightly higher yields. Well, let's talk about another trade, in fact, too. Elevated volatility and the breakdown of correlations. Peter, I know you're paying this a lot of attention. What do you think persists more? Is it the elevated volatility, the breakdown of correlations, or both? I think for me it's really the breakdown of correlations. I think we've seen equity vol be elevated for quite a while. We're just starting to see that in the Treasury market. You're seeing that move index creep up. 
But last week, you really saw this correlation breakdown where treasuries did not act as a hedge against your equity portfolios. In fact, both were going down at the same time. And so anyone who runs a risk parity type strategy or really is thoughtful about their portfolio risk, they've got to look at that and wonder if they have to cut back on both equities and treasuries into this period of changed correlation. So, Peter, what do you suggest people should do if that's what you're expecting? You know, I think you want to be very nimble. I'm comfortable owning some credit here. I do like the beaten down sectors much more, and I think you take some profits, uh, particularly in the big tech. And then again, we might get some rhetoric that's bad on corporate taxes, things like that post-election. And you know, go back to 2017 and 18, corporate tax cuts did help the market a lot. So I want to take some profits on the big winners, keep reallocating to the areas that have been left behind, and I think you're fine with credit and avoid treasuries. Are you not worried, Peter, that the U.S. goes the same way as Europe? I'm clearly a little bit worried. You know, we're seeing this caseload rise. We're, in fact, seeing more hospitalizations. I do think that we're better at dealing with it. And ultimately, just like we had at the end of March, if we start heading that way, I think we're going to get even more stimulus. So it's almost this, you know, <laughs> catch-22 where... It was easy for D.C. to ignore the need for stimulus when the stock market was going up every day, COVID cases were contained. So I think we get back to a situation like we saw in March where as COVID cases start rising, hospitalization comes through, D.C. gets its act together and delivers the stimulus that probably should have been done three months ago. Peter, I'm not criticizing you. It just always entertains me when people say things aren't great right now, but I'm bullish. But if things get worse, I'll be even more bullish because we get more stimulus. And Peter, I know you're not saying that. It's just what people might hear. Peter Cheer, yeah. fantastic to catch up with you, sir, as always. Peter Cheer there from Academy Securities. Let's get you some sector price action. An equity market that drifts higher, maybe rips higher, off the lows of last week on the S&P 500 and across Europe. Here's Abigail. John, this morning's sector action is somewhat slippery. It is risk on, though, not surprisingly, with those big gains. And the re reason I'm saying it's slippery, we've gone from the cyclicals to the growth and defensive, all trying to take on the top spot. Right now, it is more cyclical with the materials up top, consumer staples trying to sneak in there, industrials. The point to be made, though, all green on the screen. Most of these sectors, 10 of the 11 sectors, up by 1% or more, really trying uh, to reverse last week's big sell-off. Energy on bottom in sympathy with oil. As for the biggest movers to the upside on the day, John, that has to do everything with the mega cap tech stocks. There's a hole to be climbed out of, though, not surprisingly, last week, the FANG index down sharply. Tech was the worst sector last week, down 6%, its worst week since May, excuse me, March. But today, we see that some of that weakness has been uh, rebounded as Apple, Microsoft, Facebook, and the like. They are trying to get a bid from traders. Right now, it's happening. Let's see what it whether it lasts into the end of the day, John, until 4 o'clock. Abigail, let's get to 4 o'clock today and then focus on tomorrow and the day after. What a week we've got ahead of us. And Michael McKee pointing out correctly, payrolls Friday just feels like a lifetime away. Coming up, the market moving events you need to be watching through today and into the week in our trading diary. From London and New York with equities drifting higher, pushing higher, this is Bloomberg. time has come to elect the next president of the United States, and the stakes could not be higher. Two candidates, two very different paths for the future of the country. 
I'm David Weston. We will bring you the results as they unfold live on election night. Join us Tuesday, November 3rd at 7 p.m. Eastern Time on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. Bloomberg Television is reinventing one of the most iconic brands in financial television for a new audience. Join me to see the news program for the clever investor. This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. The worst week since March, potentially followed up with the biggest day of gains since the middle of October. The S&P 500 up 45. We advanced by 1.38%. The Nasdaq up by about 1.4. Top of the hour, Michael McKee breaking down the ISM manufacturing figures. A couple of days' time, we'll get the ISM services. Then it's the three events that matter to everybody. The final stretch of campaigning for the president in North Carolina, Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin. Joe Biden making his last steps in Pennsylvania and Ohio. Tomorrow, of course, the main event, Election Day in the United States. Then following that, it's the other two that hardly anyone's thinking about. The Fed on Thursday and payrolls this coming Friday. From London and New York this morning, good morning. Thank you for choosing Bloomberg TV. This was the countdown to the open. Catch me on Twitter at Ferro TV. You're watching Bloomberg TV. The time has come to elect the next president of the United States, and the stakes could not be higher. Two candidates, two very different paths for the future of the country. I'm David Weston. We will bring you the results as they unfold live on election night. Join us Tuesday, November 3rd at 7 p.m. Eastern Time on Bloomberg Television and Radio. in London, 10 a.m. in New York. London and New York separated by five hours again, 30 minutes into the trading day in the United States. In London, I'm Guy Johnson. My co-host in New York, Alex Steele. 
Welcome to Bloomberg Markets. Alex, what a week. Welcome. Welcome. 24 hours until Election Day. We also have the Fed on Thursday. Let's not forget about that. Plus Jobs Friday as well. So lots to digest here. Plus uh, that global sell-off that we saw on Friday. So really dismal week for the markets. Today we're on the front foot. Uh, 3,200 was the area many were watching for the S&P. We're obviously well above that, over 1.5% here, holding high. Uh, Morgan Stanley and Mike Wilson saying, look, buy the dip. Uh, he sees a broadening out of market participation based on earnings. Uh, one asset, though, that's not holding up, and that's the euro below its 100-day move average euro dollar moving lower the VIX though taking a break oil making a pretty strong comeback was it a five-month uh, low just made hours ago we'll talk about oil in just a second in terms of what that says about the global economy guy um, the ISM manufacturing numbers out and it's smashing it might be keys here to break it all down yeah maybe too late for an influence on the presidential election but certainly influencing uh, the way the markets are going to trade because this is a big number 59.3 in September, it was 55.4. We thought there might be a slight tick up, but this just uh, blows that away as the manufacturing industries in the United States come back quickly. Uh, new orders, 67.9 from 60.2, and production, 63 from 61. And for the first time since July of 2019, we are seeing employment above 50, 53.2 which augurs well for this Friday's numbers, at least. Uh, maybe we get some positive manufacturing. Prices paid still rising, 65.5, 62.8. Hard to know exactly what that means in terms of long-run inflation since we do have the confusions of the uh, COVID case. Uh, is it a, a shortage of materials? Is it a, a, a pipeline problem? Or are we actually seeing prices going up? Uh, exports uh, for the year uh, looks like uh, the, uh, the new export orders goes up to 55.7 from 54.3. That'll take a hit from the uh, lockdowns in Europe. But overall, this is a very good number for the economy going forward. I have to wonder, though, how much is it uh, like we've seen in Europe, where manufacturing comes back, services, though, still a little dicey. We had great numbers in Europe, and then and it uh, fell apart. it's, it's going to, uh, you know, probably drop off now that they're locking down. All right, Bloomberg's Mike McKee, thank you very much. As I mentioned, less than 24 hours to go until Election Day. you got Democratic candidate Joe Biden leading President Trump in polls nationally and in several key swing states. Uh, joining us now with more is Kevin Cirilli, Bloomberg Chief Washington Correspondent. Uh, Kevin, give us the lay of the land. Well, let's, here we go. Ready, set, go. That's the both sides try to barnstorm their way into election day to get out the vote in key battleground states. Uh, Democratic presidential nominee Joe Biden going to be focusing on what has become an incredibly important state for both sides. That's Pennsylvania. He's also going to be making a stop in Ohio, where, according to swing state polls, he is within striking distance, just down one percentage point, well within the average of polls margin of errors in the Hawkeyes, or in, in the state of Iowa. Meanwhile, the president going to be uh, keeping a marathon pace as he goes to several states today, including North Carolina. North Carolina, of course, also the site of a very contentious Senate battle where Senator uh, Tom Tillis is going to be locked in a, a dead heat with Cal Cunningham, the Democrat challenger. So uh, this is really down to the wire here as both sides uh, try to focus in on these swing states. And we'll know, can you believe it, Alex, just, just uh, in a couple of hours when those polls, first polls open, hmm. less than one day from now, Alex and Guy. Wow, what a 24 hours we are counting down to. Kevin, thank you very much indeed. Yeah. Kevin Cirilli, thank you very much. Uh, joining us now for more analysis on what we should make of these last few hours, Jeannie Zeno, Bloomberg contributor and Iona College professor. Jeannie, welcome. What's your read this election eve? Well, I hope Kevin is right that we know a lot more in 24 hours than we expect we might. If this thing comes down to Pennsylvania, as he was mentioning, such a key state where they are spanning across the state today, these candidates and their surrogates, if it comes down to Pennsylvania, we may not know for a few days or longer after this thing wraps up. So I'm trying to be optimistic, but I think Kevin may be more optimistic than I am at this point. Uh, Jeannie, there were some talks over the weekend that President Trump would declare himself uh, the winner if it looked like it was going in his favor. That report came from Axios. Uh, Trump denied that. The campaign denied that. But if that happened, what does that look like tomorrow night? It, it looks like something we've never seen in American history, where you would have an incumbent president before all the votes are counted saying that he is or declaring himself the winner. 
I still have trouble believing that is the case, and I hope when the president and the campaign come out, I'm going to take them at their word that that is not going to happen. We have to count every vote before we know who the winner is if this thing is close. Um, which is going to cause greater volatility, do you think? The presidential race or the Senate races? They're both so incredibly exciting and impactful in terms of the markets, for instance. I think the Senate is really important to watch. There is a very good shot that Joe Biden takes the presidency and Democrats take the Senate, right? It's not certainly not guaranteed. We don't know on either score. But if that happens, that promises to change policy in Washington, D.C., we would have, for the first time in, in quite a few years, we would have an all-democratic Washington. And that would say something about a variety of issues, from taxation to regulation to the environment to education, certainly a stimulus bill. So we want to watch out for that. And, you know, a year ago, we wouldn't have said that Democrats are in striking distance of the Senate, but they clearly are now. And Kevin was just mentioning one of the key races to watch North Carolina, but there are others as well. Maine, we have Susan Collins, and you have just Senate races across the country that Democrats can pick off. If they get three and Biden wins, they have enough to take the Senate. If they get four and Biden loses, they have enough to take the Senate. So they're in striking distance there. Yeah, Jeannie, can you define striking distance? Because I feel like the market's trying to then eventually understand the distinction between a blue wave and, say, a light blue wave, where you, you know have a slight majority in the Senate, but that doesn't mean that all of a sudden everything gets through versus something where you can end the filibuster and everything can get through. Yeah, I, I am not one who thinks we're going to have a blue wave where Democrats take the Senate you know, by huge numbers. And then, you know, really we get this unprecedented support for sort of far left progressive policies. We need to remember that some of these candidates are running in districts that are not incredibly progressive or liberal. They're more purple districts. So I myself think we're looking at, if anything, more of, as you called it, a light blue wave. I think Democrats have a chance now to pick up between two and five or six seats in the Senate. It's not going to change things completely, but with Democrats in control, certainly if they take the White House and the Senate, we could see policy changes afoot, certainly pulling back on some of what President Trump has done and under Mitch McConnell, the Senate has done in the last four years. What do you think the period between now and Christmas looks like if Trump oh. wins? It's such a good question. You know, if Trump wins, um, you know, I think we're probably in it. Again, it depends on who wins the Senate. They obviously won't be in if it's the Democrats until January. Um, but I think if Trump wins, I think we're probably going to see more of the same out of President Trump. I do think, I hope, and maybe I'm just being optimistic, that we would see a stimulus bill out of, out of the Senate. I'm not convinced we will. But I do think that the bigger question is going to be if Trump loses and the Republicans lose the Senate, what does the next two months look like? And I think that's anybody's guess. It's a long time for people who are lame ducks to be sitting there. Uh, Jeannie, maybe an unfair question, but uh, really micro tomorrow um, when traders are going to be looking at numbers, polls, etc. What's the number one thing you're looking at? Because we've never been in this place where so many people have voted before actual voting day and so many absentee ballots and mail-in voting, for example. What's the number you're looking at? Um, you know, I, I think what I'm looking at is do we see a pickup from Joe Biden in any of these south, southwestern, southern states? And if we see him pick up a state in the Sun Belt early, I think it's going to bode very badly for the president. So that's the number one thing I'm looking at. I'm also looking at states like Indiana. We'll get those results early. Certainly not a battleground state, but it has a number of voters who went from Obama to Trump. I think if we see that, you know, movement in favor of Trump, I think it's going to bode well for the president going forward. So those are sort of two key things I'm going to be looking for early tomorrow night. All right, Jeannie, thanks so much. We really appreciate it. Looking forward to Jeannie Zeno, Bloomberg contributor and Iona College professor. Thanks very much. And tune in to our special coverage of the election tomorrow. That kicks off at 7 p.m. in New York. Well, coming up right now, we're going to focus on the potential volatility around the election. We got you covered. Joshua Younger, J.P. Morgan U.S. Rate Strategist, Managing Director, and Manisha Spande, Bar Barclays Head of U.S. Equity and Global Derivatives Strategy. This is Bloomberg.
retail, I think, is strong. We see a lot of people ordering online or going to the grocery store and buying and eating at home. We just don't know what restaurants are going to do this year in the state of Florida, which is the largest consumer of the crab. Check in on the Bloomberg First Word News now. I'm Ritika Gupta. President Trump is suggesting he may fire infectious diseases chief Anthony Fauci after the election. Over the weekend, Fauci told the Washington Post the U.S. is, quote, in for a whole lot of hurt from the coronavirus this winter. There were chants of fire Fauci at a Trump rally in Florida last night, and the president hinted he may do that once the election's over. In the UK, one of Prime Minister Boris Johnson's top ministers says a months-long lockdown for England may have to be extended. Cabinet Office Minister Michael Gove says the lockdown will be reviewed on December the 2nd. And if the coronavirus data isn't good enough, the lockdown could continue. Scientists warn that the National Health Service may be overwhelmed by this latest outbreak. Former National Security Agency whistleblower Edward Snowden is applying for Russian citizenship. Snowden and his wife are expecting a baby. He cited the child as motivation to become a dual U.S.-Russian citizen. Russian President Vladimir Putin granted Snowden asylum back in 2013 after he revealed highly classified NSA surveillance programs. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. Alex? All right, thanks so much, Ritika. So one of the things that traders were really bracing for uh, this election season was a contested election. Now, this chart is the difference between November VIX futures curve versus the December VIX future curve, and you see that it's come down. Now, as it, and then it came back up only recently. It means that some of the volatility shorter term is being priced out. Joining us now for more, Joshua Younger, J.P. Morgan, U.S. Rate Strategy Managing Director, and Manish Despande, Barclays Head of U.S. Equity and Global Derivatives Strategy. We have you covered from all different angles here. So, Manish, the first thing for you is, what's in the market right now? What's positioning? What does the hedging look like? So, right now, I think it is uh, useful to think of the level of VIX futures of VIX as um, incorporating two different effects, right? So one is an election premium, which we think is around, let's call it 10 ball points. Um, and the rest is, let's call it sort of the COVID or vaccine risk premium. So, so right now, both of them are in play. Uh, but we think that if we get a decisive victory, let's say, you know, Joe Biden wins uh, convincingly uh, tomorrow or the, or, or the next few days, then that premium will come down. But the rest of the premium, i.e. what is happening in Europe and potentially here, uh, and then the risk of a vaccine not coming through, that risk premium is still going to stay. Same question to you, Joshua. What do you think is priced right now? What is the market signaling? So we also have a lot of event risk in, in rates. Uh, it's more concentrated at this point around the election date itself by several measures. And, and so, you know, typically you'll see an, ex an excess of maybe one to two times the background level of volatility. And this time around, we're looking at three to four. That was as high as five, six, seven times earlier in September. So, uh, you know, a lot of that has also been priced out, but there's a sense that, that the election could be could be a major catalyst. I, I think the key here is not just the presidential result, which is obviously highly relevant, but the fact that the fiscal outlook for both candidates is fairly similar from a, from a rates perspective. We need to know what can get through Congress. And so the potential for the Senate to be 
uh, up in the air for, for several weeks is a big part of this. Hey, Joshua, it seems like the consensus view to that is that if you have a blue wave, you're looking at a steepener. If you have a split Senate versus White House, you look at a bull flattening. That feels consensus now. Is it and is that legit? There's definitely consensus, uh, or it's a consensus view. That doesn't mean it will happen that way. Uh, but I, I think the way rates behaved last week during the risk-off move is indicative of a market that is positioned for a blue wave. We really got very little movement in rates despite a pretty substantial sell-off in equities, and usually you'd expect those two things to be connected. So uh, much of this blue wave view, I, I think, is priced in at this point, potentially taking some of it out recently. But you know, I think the lesson of 2016 uh, over, the, over the course of that evening is that the initial reaction of the market might be different from what ultimately gets priced over time. Uh, but, you know, definitely a, a reasonably high probability of a Democratic sweep priced in at this point. Manish, if that's not the case, if President Trump wins, just give me a sense of how that will affect volatility pricing. So, so I think it is important to break down the effect um, into the medium term and the short term. So in the medium term, the policy mix and everything else matters. Obviously, are we going to get a tax hike? Uh, are we going to get the infrastructure spending plan? Are we going to get a larger fiscal st pandemic-related fiscal stimulus? All that matters for the medium term. But to me, I think in the short term, what really matters is how quickly do we know the result. Right? So you can think of three scenarios. One is a decisive victory, like I said, over the next few days, we know who the president is. The second scenario is sort of too close to call, which is similar to the 2000 election, that we are going through December and legal challenges are being mounted, but they do get resolved by early December before the Electoral College meets. The third scenario, which to me is a tail risk, but that is what the market is most concerned about, is that we're sitting in the middle of December and we don't know who the president is. Now, from this short-term perspective, actually it doesn't matter who wins. As long as there is clarity and we don't get to the third scenario, I think that's going to be a positive thing on the, on, on, on the, on the margin. Having said that, the way that the market is looking at it, I think a Biden win, especially because that will result in a slightly bigger and more comprehensive pandemic stimulus bill, that will be viewed more positively. So even if Trump wins, you know, immediately, you know, maybe it's, it's a, it will be upset victory, obviously, given where the polls are, but that might be viewed on the margin positively by the market. Okay, so, so let me say something counterintuitive here, Manish. So the reason why uh, we care about that uncertainty is because it dictates what kind of fiscal stimulus we will get, which is exactly what markets care about. But then we get this ISM manufacturing number, blows the doors off the barn, <laughs> as we were talking about uh, on our chat here. Um, do we need it? Like, is the number that the market thinks we need actually something that we need, and does that reduce the kind of upside potential? Uh, it does to that to to some extent, but keep in mind that we've got another sort of uh, you know factor now, uh, that of a second wave in Europe and potentially let's call it a third wave in in the U.S. And that is so there is a there are two forces buffeting it. If if this number had come without what is happening in Europe, then obviously yes, certainly that the impact of the fiscal of the pandemic stimulus will be less concerning. But just given what is happening and you know ISM and all those numbers are you know clearly backward looking. It is not clear what is going to happen um, over the next few months. Joshua, let's talk a little bit about, about the second slash third wave uh, and the impact that it's likely to have on the data um, and the economy. In terms of how we should think about the rates market, which is the more important story between now and Christmas? What happens with the U.S. election and the Senate on one hand and what happens with the rate of change in the virus count? Just in terms of, of how, the, how, how the rates market is going to think about that. Yeah, I, I think the two are very strongly connected in the sense that it's less about, because this, this epidemiological outlook is so uncertain and, and is subject to change over a very rapid time scale, the way I think about it is it's more about the government's ability and willingness to respond than it is about the specific policies being proposed right now. Because as we're seeing in Europe, the outlook can swing very quickly uh, and, and somewhat unexpectedly. So in a world where you have split control of government or an uncertain outcome where we don't know who's in control of government, even during the lame duck session, uh, the, the ability of the of government to provide stimulus when needed is much less. And so it, it, that necessarily puts a premium on the rates market because you don't have that fiscal impulse. Whereas in, in the case where you have very clear control, and especially if you have unified democratic control, which they've definitely pushed for more stimulus, then, then that has implications for 
uh, the supply outlook and, and the inflation outlook and the growth outlook and all of those other things. So, so that's the way, it, it, given this very unique economic circumstance, uh, this, the flexibility of government, the willingness and ability of government to respond is the key variable. All right, Joshua, so we also have the Fed coming on Thursday. What's your top trade right now? Uh, so we're in steepeners. Uh, that's more around the election than the Fed. We don't think the Fed meeting is going to be a particularly significant event um, because you know, we're in the middle of, of things to, to some extent, and so they're not likely to change their policy in any material way. Uh, over the long run, we can we can talk about more sort of substantive potential changes in policy, how they actually implement their new um, framework, and even over the longer term, you know, who potentially is in charge once Powell's term is over. But, you know, for Wednesday, we don't think there's going to be a significant change. We'll leave it there. Thanks for your time today, both of you. We really appreciate it. Joshua Younger of J.P. Morgan, Manish Dishpande of Barclays. Appreciate it. This is Bloomberg. Women leaders were actually better at controlling the deaths from COVID-19. Do you think out of this pandemic, we'll see more countries be willing to elect female leaders? When we look at women leaders, we tend to project on them baggage that they shouldn't bear. Women are given an opportunity when no one else wants to do the job. Women had a very clear objective. Uh, they wanted to save lives. The women leaders if you look at their careers, have also built up a level of, of trust. In fact, women have to be better at communication in order to be elected uh, as leaders, whereas this doesn't hold true for men. We need to get those sexist stereotypes out of our head and give women a fair run for leadership. Trying to change the stereotypes about women is not only the business of women, but men have to be part of it. trends, investments, and competition of the European ETF industry. Join us on Bloomberg ETF IQ Europe. So as we've already indicated, it's going to be a busy week. And Alex, later this week, we're going to see the debut of the world's largest IPO. Ant Group set to begin trading in Hong Kong Thursday. Bloomberg learning that institutional investors are buying Ant's Hong Kong shares on the grey market at a 50% premium. They're going out of the door at 80. We're seeing trades going through at 120. Remember, institutional investors, uh, they closed the book on them a little early. So it looks like they're out there trying to bid up prices. But if we see it going out of the door at 120, this is going to be an epic IPO. Um, uh, it, it's, it's going to be interesting to see, given everything else that's going on, whether or not the volatility that we could see could affect the IPO as well. Uh, I think it's already epic. Uh, I mean, anywhere you look, you could throw a dart and hit a really cool stat. So apparently demand for the retail portion uh, of this IPO in Shanghai exceeded the initial supply by more than 870 times. I don't know if my brain can compute that much. Um, just to show that on all cylinders, uh, it's firing pretty hard. Even the banks that were on the IPO, their stock soared up like 31% uh, today. That, that's a derivative play of this massive IPO. Yeah, I did. there's some reporting going around that Jack Ma has been called in by the authorities. I think I saw it on the FT a little bit earlier on. The PBOC being, uh, calling him in, asking questions. Not sure what those questions are going to be. But this story is also getting caught up in the China-US trade tension too. Uh, and, and the Chinese pushing back, making sure that 
Alibaba, Baba, and, and don't get caught up. Uh, and there are concerns that they certainly could be from the Chinese side of the equation. Uh, this is such a huge IPO. A few years ago, it would have taken place in the U.S. The fact mm -hmm. that it's not, I think, is hugely significant. Yeah, and sort of uh, it speaks to the fact that the decoupling that you see within the U.S. and China on the tech world could still happen regardless of who is in the White House. Um, not necessarily that uh, Biden would be any friendlier to China, but that maybe the way they go about it's different. But on the technology side, uh, how do you have any kind of cooperation when there's national security involved? And it feels like both sides of the aisle are pretty firm on that stance. So will we just to see these two tech markets developing in just very different ways with more of the action maybe coming uh, for now from China? Yep, and China trying to do its best at the moment to figure out a way of getting around some of the restrictions that have been created by the U.S. You're going to look at what's happening with Huawei. Uh, what are we going to do next? Uh, top policy risks for U.S. businesses. We're going to discuss all of that with the Wall Street ve veteran. Uh, Charles Meyer Signum, Global Trading Chairman, is going to be joining us. That's coming up. This is Bloomberg. Y estábamos viviendo en unas, en dos casas, en unas 50 personas y en la otra, otras 50. En cada casa había cinco habitaciones. En cada habitación había de tres a cuatro camas abarrotadas. Vivíamos de seis a siete personas. Un baño para cada habitación y una cocina para todas. Al salir, nos avisó una compañera que ya nos habían reportado a migración. Gracias a Dios, ahorita de salud yo estoy muy bien, pero en lo moral no estoy muy bien, porque a causa de esta enfermedad yo perdí todo, perdí mi trabajo. Yo creo que mi caso resulta un gran problema de cómo las personas migrantes estamos en riesgo de explotación por parte de los empleadores. Mercedes-Benz is on a path towards CO2-neutral uh, mobility, so we have flicked the switch there, and really, uh, we're going to step-by-step step electrify everything. And what does that mean? Combustion engines get electrified. This is a market that, over the past few weeks, has made it clear it wants to go higher. It got a little spooked by the idea that geopolitical potentials are rising. Hi from London, I'm Guy Johnson. Uh, welcome to Bloomberg Markets. Alex Dill is over in New York. So a hypothetical Biden victory in tomorrow's US election would likely mean higher taxes for companies and individuals. Scholar Fu has an overview. 
Thank you so much, Guy. Yeah, one of the Trump administration's crowning achievements, of course, is a tax cut package passed at the end of 2017. Remember, it slashed the corporate tax rate to 21% from 35%, making the U.S. a lot more competitive with other countries. And to incentivize companies to keep manufacturing at home rather than outsource overseas, companies are allowed to deduct uh, the full cost of equipment spending until 2023. And, of course, money stashed overseas can be repatriated home at a lower rate, again, to spur spending at home. And of course, the market took notice of this, sent stocks higher, GDP bounced, and of course, we saw unemployment fall to four decade lows. Now, Joe Biden is looking to roll back a lot of these tax cuts. For companies, that entails lifting the corporate tax rate to 28%, which is still lower than the 35% previously, and raising the tax on foreign earnings of U.S. companies, and of course, targeting the rich. Now, the top personal tax rate would increase to almost 40% from the current 37%, and those same folks would see their capital gains and dividends tacked at that higher rate as well. The question, of course, is whether any of these Biden proposals will get watered down because, of course, the economy is in a lot weaker state because of COVID than before, even with that record third quarter GDP bounce. And on top of that, if the Democrats win the Senate, of course, they'll have a narrow majority and they'll have to appeal to the centrists in the party. Now, Goldman Sachs estimates that Biden's current tax proposals would cut the S&P 500 earnings by 9% in 2022, with the full impact felt a year later. If you go back and look at what's happened over the past six months, as Biden has seen his polling improve, and that would be the white line there, we've seen companies with low tax rates also move in tandem with the odds of his winning. That, of course, is in contrast to what we saw in 2018, when companies with high tax rates outperformed because they were seen as the outsized beneficiaries of those tax cuts. Alex? Great setup. Thank you so much, Scarlett Thu. And let's talk about taxes, because U.S. executives actually see corporate tax policy as the top risk for businesses under a Biden administration. That beats the virus. That's according to a PwC report. 62% of business leaders see the tax code changes as the biggest threat. While joining us now for Wall Street Perspective, Charles Myers, Signum Global Chairman and former Evercore Vice Chairman. He also advised Hillary Clinton and Joe Biden's presidential campaigns. Joining us now, Bloomberg's uh, Wall Street correspondent, Shanali Basic. Guys, thanks for joining. Um, Charles, let's start with you on this. Um, why are the corporations so afraid of these taxes and markets just do not seem to care? <laughs> I think uh, there's a disconnect out there between expectations and what will most likely happen next year if Biden wins with the Senate, which is that the magnitude by which both corporate and personal taxes are going to go up next year um, and be retroactive to Jan 1, 2021. Um, is much more likely than the sort of overall narrative or perception that's being put out there that, in fact, Biden's going to inherit a weak economy, go slower on tax increases, and, in fact, uh, have them phased in starting in 2022. I think that latter narrative is very dangerous, and I think that's partly what's been priced in today, and I think uh, we're in for a bit of a wake-up call next year on that. But, Charles, how realistic is this to get done quickly? Let's be honest, even with a Senate majority blue sweep, it's not that every senator who's Democratic is going to vote for all of the tax changes that are in the Biden plan. How much of a debate are we going to see as the administration tries to get some of these passed? Should they be in, in power? Yes, yeah, so I think there's two things that will be at play next year, on the, on early next year on this uh, on the tax issue. The first is that uh, all, they, all they're going to need is a 51 uh, uh, vote majority because they'll get it through the rec budget reconciliation process. So even if, you know, uh, you know, again, they, they really only need 51 senators. And we think that the Democrats will probably have 52 or 53 seats in the Senate. So but that's one issue that will be at play, of course, is what their majority looks like. But again, reconciliation, they only need 51 votes. The second thing, which is very important and, and a lot of people lost sight of, um, is the fact that the debt ceiling has to be raised by July of next year. So we've been saying, in fact, that no matter who wins tomorrow, even if President Trump wins, which is not our base case, but no matter who wins, taxes are going up next year. They will be re retracted to Jan 1 because the debt ceiling has to be raised. Uh, so, uh, again, I think on the timing issue, uh, uh, in addition to the need for a majority, both of those are coming together uh, and I think tell us that taxes are going up next year, both corporate and personal, and will be retroactive. So barring taxes, what are maybe some of the more aggressive policies under a potential Biden administration that you think are not being priced into the market right now? So aside from tax, which by far we think is the most underpriced risk today in the U.S. equity market, uh, again, the estimates are anywhere from 9 to 12 percent hit to EPS 
and people are looking out to 2022, we think it's a hit DPS next year for the on average for the S&P 500 companies. In addition to that, though, uh, I think people are underestimating what a Biden administration intends to do on drug prices uh, and, and secondly, in energy policy. Uh, because those latter two, which affect a lot of uh, you know uh, companies and obviously two pretty important sectors for the markets, um, uh, he can get a lot of the, the necessary change in those two areas done without Congress. So again, I think it's pharma and energy, particularly fossil fuels, uh, where we could see, uh, again, a lot of executive action next year that might be underpriced today in the market. Charles, good morning. Um, the Biden team has raised a lot of money from Wall Street and from corporate leaders. And I'm curious how those conversations have gone. What have the Biden team been telling those people that has allowed those people to give the Biden team a lot of money? And there does seem to be a mismatch between that and what you're saying. Yes, yeah, so I think it's really two things. When conversations have happened with some of the biggest donors or with the private sector, with folks from financial services, et cetera, uh, from the campaign, the message is twofold. First, uh, uh, in the end, if, if in fact Biden can do what he would like to do, which is get about a two, two plus trillion dollar stimulus package done at the end of January, followed by uh, a two and a half trillion or larger infrastructure package in Q1 or Q2, that the tax increases actually uh, will be offset by the uh, much bigger impact on growth from both of those two positive stimulus and infrastructure. Um, the second issue, which actually resonates with a lot of folks in the private sector, a lot of CEOs and other, is that there's a real need for stability uh, and predictability predictability in, pro in uh, policy making, which is missing today. The last quick thing I would layer over all of that is a very strong sense of, you know, the tax code and the majority of the Trump tax cuts did actually benefit companies and the wealthiest Americans. There is a real sense in this country we need to do something about systemic inequality, income inequality, gender inequality, racial inequality, and that the private sector and certainly the C-suites have bought into that. And one way to do it is through the tax code and that those changes need to be made. I think it's a combination of all of those, that, that there's much more buy-in from the private sector, including at the top of companies uh, around these tax increases. Charles. What is the skill set do you think the Biden team is looking for if they were to win in the Treasury Secretary they would select? I think in the end it's going to be a compromised candidate. Uh, initially it was going to be someone from financial services. I think the progressive wing of the party killed that pretty effectively months ago. Uh, and, and then it was, uh, you know, and still is a lot of noise around whether it's Elizabeth Warren or someone that's from the very progressive wing of the party. And I don't think that's going to happen either. I think it will be Lael Brainerd. She's clearly the front runner today. Um, and I think it'd be an excellent choice and very market positive because she's been dovish at the Fed, but also very pro stimulus. So I think in, in that position, as with a lot of the important cabinet positions, Biden's going to go with the centrist that's probably technically very good, uh, but not uh, controversial. Charles, if we do get a President Trump win, what does Wall Street do with that? I think if we get a Trump win, you know, it'll be, uh, I'd argue, an even bigger surprise or upset than in 2016. You see the market clearly rally uh, on expectation of tax cuts, further deregulation, uh, et cetera. But I think reality will start to set in pretty quickly. We're uh, entering a second wave of COVID that's uh, been incredibly uh, painful in Europe and I think is heading here. Uh, all the evidence points to that. Uh, so there's going to be concern there. Secondly, whether or not he can get another round of stimulus through. Uh, and then thirdly, as I said earlier, we've got to raise the debt ceiling in July. Taxes are going to have to go up. Uh, the only way uh, uh, President Trump will be able to get the debt ceiling raised next year because the Democrats in the House will hold his administration hostage and force tax increases in exchange for lifting the ceiling. Uh, he's also going to have to give in. Reality will start to set in, I think, if, if President Trump wins. And I think that the market will be far less enthusiastic after the initial pop. And to that note, too, what happens if we don't get a blue wave? Uh, I think the, the um, probably worst case scenario for the market, uh, aside from a long protracted delayed outcome, which we don't think will happen, we think, in fact, uh, we'll know uh, a very strong and very good preliminary result within 24 to 48 hours of the election. Um, but but uh, barring that, the, the second worst outcome would be a Biden win without the Senate. And I know historically, divided government's always been seen as most the most positive for the markets because gridlock prevents uh, either side from pushing through, through things that are too extreme. In this case, divided government, uh, Biden and the White House without the Senate, means that getting even emergency stimulus through in January is going to be very tough. And this country is going to need it, uh, especially with this second wave coming. So I worry about that scenario more than I do about most others. How 
hard on Wall Street do you think this next admission, administration is going to be? You know, we talked about the potential Treasury Secretary here, but, uh, and Wall Street does come up in the Democratic uh, agenda right away, but is it really going to be as hard on the industry as we believe? You know, I think that uh, it's a little bit of a red herring out there. You know, uh, uh, the banks have actually done a pretty good job since 2008, 2009 of reforming uh, certainly their most uh, egregious or abusive practices. Um, and I think that instead, what you'll see from a Biden administration on the regulatory side is much more attention focused on drug prices, much more attention focused on energy, not whether they ban fracking or not. That's a red herring as well. I think there's just going to be much tighter regulation of, of uh, fossil fuels. And then within financial services, I think, you know, it, it's not a huge priority for the administration. So where within financial services, a Biden administration will focus is on the consumer protection side. Um, I think there's still uh, parts of that industry that are uh, clearly engaged in abusive practices, and that's probably where most of the attention will be focused. I think financial services mm -hmm. under a Biden administration does very well. And real quick here, Charles, too, how do you feel about the technology industry? I know you've said over at Signum you guys are internally debating how hard he might be there. Yeah, I think people are underestimating it because, again, you know, the four big or most of the big tech companies have been a big part of the solution around COVID in terms of how we live our lives and work now. But the truth is that the antitrust move, which is well underway, will accelerate under a Biden administration. We'll have a much more aggressive Department of Justice with a much more aggressive view uh, on antitrust. And I think between that and privacy, the four big U.S. tech companies will look quite different uh, two or three years from now. People underestimate, I think, how large a priority that is already and that the process is underway even before Biden takes office. The game is afoot. Our thanks to Charles Myers <laughs> of Signum Global and Bloomberg's Shanali Basak. Uh, Boris Johnson, the British Prime Minister, is currently on his feet, I understand, uh, down in the House of Commons, uh, updating the House on what he said over the weekend, this one-month lockdown um, that is going to have a pretty dramatic effect uh, on UK data. So England going into that four-month lockdown, uh, the other parts of the United Kingdom going their separate ways. Anyway, Boris Johnson speaking now. I think you can probably find it on live. Go on your terminal if you would like to follow what the Prime Minister is saying. This is Bloomberg. This virus damage our children's futures. So schools will remain open, colleges, universities, childcare and early years settings. And I am pleased that this will command support, Mr. Speaker, across this house. It's also... weekly review of the most important business news analysis and interviews from Bloomberg Television around the world. Ken Burns, welcome to Bloomberg Big Decisions. We have always been a mixture of things. We are always stronger for that mixture. Growth is a way to stay competitive, delight more and more consumers. Welcome to the best of Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang. They've moved the needle by acknowledging that they have to monitor the content. What is one word of advice you'll take with you? Learn how to listen. And that is certainly something that has served me well. Ankiti, where do you go from here? It's a huge market. It's a huge opportunity. I want to go 100x from here. Our philosophy is to partner where we can and stand apart when we should. Just days away from the most critical election in U.S. history, and it's only democracy at stake. From electronic voting machines to misinformation and fake news and political advertising on social media, is the tech industry ready for its biggest test yet? I'm Emily Chang, and we'll be focusing on these issues all week on Bloomberg Technology in a special electioneering series. Tune in, 5 p.m. Eastern, 2 p.m. Pacific, only on Bloomberg Television.
Welcome to That's Debatable, an interactive series on today's most pressing issues. The resolution this time, is a U.S.-China space race good for humanity? We'll hear from both sides. The competition, if you look at the past, led to innovation. A whole new arms race could start. And we'll get your perspective, too, with help from the artificial intelligence of IBM Watson. I'm John Donvan. Join us for That's Debatable, presented by Bloomberg and Intelligence Squared, Friday on Bloomberg Television. Let's check in on the Bloomberg First Word News now. I'm Ritika Gupta. President Trump enters the final day of the campaign, hoping for another poll-defying victory. Surveys show the president trailing Joe Biden nationally and in a number of battleground states. Still, the numbers have been tightening in some of those races. Both candidates will be campaigning today in Pennsylvania, where polls show Biden with a slight advantage. Over the weekend, pre-election day voting surpassed two-thirds of all the ballots cast in the 2016 presidential election. That's almost 92 million Americans that have voted so far. The majority of states are reporting record early turnout. And Brexit negotiators are moving closer to breaking the impasse over one of the biggest obstacles to a trade deal. A compromise is emerging on the issue of what access boats from the EU will have to British fishing waters. The potential solution would allow Britain to claim it has won back control of its seas. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Rishka Gupta. This is Bloomberg. Guy. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Ritika. So the Prime Minister has just finished speaking uh, down in the Houses of Parliament, uh, ad addressing parliamentarians on his current plans. He is facing something of a, uh, a rearguard action uh, when it comes to dealing with uh, a number of MPs within his own party who are concerned about the lockdown that is being employed. Um, there is financial help on the way. We are seeing a doubling of support for the unemployed. Nevertheless, the virus does seem to be largely in control of this process. Joining us now, Sam Frizzelli, Director of Research at Bloomberg Intelligence. Sam, I, I want to talk about not where we are now, but where we're going. Um, how long is it going to be before we understand whether or not the programs that are being employed here in the UK and elsewhere around Europe are having a meaningful impact? It is easy to get in. I say easy, it's probably not easy, but, but it is easier to get in than get out. Yeah, hi, guys. So obviously it depends on what the threshold is. So if you go for the Australia-Melbourne threshold of zero COVID-19 new infections, that took 112 days, right? Here in France, they've set up 5,000 per day, and we had 46,000 or so yesterday, I think, or at least on Friday. <laughs> in the UK, I don't know if they have a specific threshold. I think they work more with the R number, and they'd like to get that below zero. But this is the problem. If you reopen, which is what we did, when there is a virus still visibly around, then you have a risk of higher transmission. Even in Australia, I don't think that they're in the clear because you don't know how many people there are out there still that are asymptomatic. So, 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 so Sam, let me ask sorry. that in a different way. So if you don't know the threshold for getting out, what do you do while you're in it? Because what uh, Boris Johnson also said is that they're looking at a rapid mass COVID testing program to begin in days. It's like, what are they gonna do in this lockdown that they couldn't do in the other one? <laughs> Okay, so there's, there's lots that they can do this time. There is, there's a, a fantastic piece of research that was done by a group in the U.S. Um, associated with um, Colorado University and, and, um, uh, and, and, and Harvard, where they showed that if you do rapid testing, not this usual thing that takes two or three days to give you an answer, during this period, you do rapid testing that gives you that antigen result in 15 minutes, which are now available and weren't available then, and you do that every three days or even once a week, over a period of four to six weeks, you can, you can stop the pandemic or you can have a pretty good chance of stopping the pandemic. So this time we do, do we have, have enough it, of them? Would, oh, do we have enough that, of those tests? Yeah, yeah, that's the crux of it. So I, I don't think there's enough, but you can but try, right? It is at least it's good that they're doing it. And remember, they've, they've, they did that in um, Slovenia and they're doing it in Slovenia and it makes a difference. Because you, what you want is to catch people while they're infectious and tell them, look, hang on, stay home, let this pass, and then you can come out. If you do that, it's, it's, it's as good as a vaccine. How does it get rolled? How does something like that get implemented in a very large country? Slovenia, obviously, very different. 
Yeah, so you're going to need uh, community nurses, and, you know, they had thousands of people. Every medical professional, I think, was involved in doing this. So, yes, there are only about a four or five million population country. Here, you're going to have to be a bit more, um, uh, accept the fact that it could take longer to do that. But if you're doing it during a lockdown, it gives you an opportunity to at least know that as soon as you find somebody, they are already isolated and not running around in the streets. Uh, Boris Johnson talking about the vaccine, quote, real prospects of COVID vaccine in the first quarter. Um, would you agree with that? Yeah, I mean, he doesn't know anything more today than he did yesterday or a week before or a week before that. Every single vaccine that gets tested seems to show at least an immune reaction. We're just waiting to find out if they prevent disease. And um, I suspect Moderna and Pfizer will give us some of that information in the next few weeks. Sam, it's always good to catch up with you. We, we really appreciate it, uh, getting that on-the-ground analysis there. Sam Fazelli, Director of Research over at Bloomberg Intelligence. All right, coming up on the program, you got oil clawing back some of its earlier losses. That's coming up next in today's Futures in Focus. What is the realistic bottom here? This is Bloomberg. CPG history, their experience, and really how we might be able to um, uh, combine together to really create this fantastic public company. And so uh, we kind of got into this back thing a little bit before it became such a hot method of going public. I'm Alex Steele along with Guy Johnson over in London. This is Bloomberg Markets. It's time now for Futures in Focus. We're taking a look at oil. Okay, crude erasing some of its earlier losses but got really hammered last week a near a five-month low. Joining us now, Mike McGlone of Bloomberg Intelligence. The technical question, did we find the short-term bottom? Well, I think the good thing about crude oil this year is the bottom's in forever. Minus 40. We're never going to see that again. So we got <laughs> that going. Short term. Short term, <laughs> maybe if the stock market can go up. And it depends on if, you know, if we get that, that the Democratic sweep, the focus will be more on, on cr in reducing demand, i.e. clean energy. Right now, it's on increasing supply with Donald Trump. So I think what we should look forward to crude oil is really good resistance around 40. Pretty good support around 30 and stuck in that range for a long time. Mike, oil moved a little earlier on, but so did a whole bunch of other commodities. Kind of felt like the basket was moving rather than the individual components. Is this a dollar trade more than anything else? A dollar is a big part of it. And this year, remember, the, the trade-weighted broad dollar index reached an all-time high. So mean reversion in the dollar, if it could continue lower, that's a good sign that commodities are bottoming. I'm getting those indications in every sector except energy, metals. If there's weakness in the dollar, metals, copper usually does very well, definitely gold. And agriculture, U.S. is a major exporter of grains. If we get weakness there, that'll pick up. So I'm seeing that as a big sign. So that's one thing we have to look forward to the next few years. If we have mean reversion in the dollar, dollar weakness, commodities are breaking out higher 
versus the stock market. But I wonder if, if, if oil's a little different in that, look at copper and what we've seen uh, in the oil market. If it was about growth and about the dollar, they wouldn't be behaving this erratically. Uh, copper has been on a steady bull market. This to me is a supply story. It's Libya surprising the market, being able to sustain some volumes online when many thought that they wasn't gonna be able to hack it. That's the problem, on the, the endless problem for real. Too much supply, more coming on, lack of demand. It's really not coming. There's no more elasticity of demand in crude oil. But copper, I'm glad you mentioned, is really the key thing. I was really worried about initially, but this divergent strength in copper versus stock market, to me, is a sign it's ready to break above that $7,000 threshold. That's held since, since 2013, and all it needs is a little weakness in the dollar, and more of the same with this demand from China. And then let's think infrastructure spending. Every country in the world, most countries in the world are getting free money. So why not take that money and spend it on infrastructure? And I think that's what we're going to see, especially in this country with the, this big fiscal stimulus coming. Mike, always a pleasure. Thanks for your time today updating us. Mike McGlone of Bloomberg Intelligence on what's happening in the commodity space. Uh, up next, we'll carry on the conversation about what is going on um, here in Europe. I, we've got Jordan Rochester joining us, the Muro G10FX strategist. The Euro's trading kind of around the 116 level. The European equities are bouncing back pretty strongly. They're still down pretty dramatically over the last five days, uh, but certainly recouping some of last week's big losses that we saw. We'll get more analysis in just a moment. The European close is coming up. This is Bloomberg. reminder, isn't it, just how sensitive the markets are to any commentary about trade. We did see some pressure on the yuan. We did see some pressure on the futures. That is now being reversed. Live 
from London, I'm Guy Johnson. Alex Steele's over in New York. We're counting you down to the European close right here on Bloomberg Market. So what do you need to know from Europe this hour? Well, locking down. Europe accelerating into tighter virus restrictions. Angela Merkel warning that the light at the end of the tunnel is still far away. Bargain hunting. Ryanair flying over the COVID thunderclouds. The low-cost giant CEO Michael O'Leary predicting huge market share gains post the vaccine. Before that, though, he's warning that winter looks very tough. And Europe, like everywhere else, holding its breath ahead of the U.S. election. Equity volatility continues to fall from October's peak. Stocks are rising today. Let's take a look at how much we're near session highs here in Europe right now. Uh, after yesterday's drubbing for European equities, last week's drubbing, should I say, uh, we are seeing a bounce back. We're up by 1.5% on the stock 600. Some markets up more than that. The S&P up by one2 Euro dollar, though, still trading around that 116 level. We'll get some analysis on that in just a moment. We're down by one-tenth of 1%. 1 Crude just coming off its lows. The other thing that's worth mentioning as well is that we are seeing the curve flattening back down a little bit today. Big moves in the 30-year on both sides of the Atlantic. Alex. Well, just moments ago, Prime Minister Boris Johnson defended his one-month lockdown, a plan for England. Uh, he spoke in the House of Commons. We are not going back to the full-scale lockdown of March and April, and there are ways in which these measures are less prohibitive. Johnson also promised mass COVID testing program to begin within days, that rapid test. Joining us now on the phone from London is Bloomberg government reporter Emily Ashton. Uh, Emily, what is going to be the takeaway over the next four to six weeks? What kind of guarantee do we have that these actually end December 2nd? Well, this is the concern of Conservative MPs, um, the lawmakers here in Parliament. So we have this vote on Wednesday on whether this second lockdown will go ahead. I think we expect that uh, vote to be approved despite maybe about a dozen of Boris Johnson's own colleagues raising concerns um, about civil liberties, about the impact on businesses, and about whether this lockdown will be extended post-December the 2nd, this end date. Um, but Boris Johnson has just said, look, you will get a vote on that, that week, the December the 2nd week, as to whether you want to extend it or not, giving them that reassurance that we're not going to extend this forever. Um, but he, Boris Johnson was saying, look, what we want to do is to get this R rate down to make sure the virus doesn't keep spreading. If we could do that for four weeks, get that rate down, um, and then hopefully we can get on top of it. And then the next stage is that mass testing, making sure that we can test people in schools and in institutions so that we can just keep that economy going. And that's what he's pinning his hopes on now. We're not likely to see a vaccine until next spring, the government is saying. But if we can get that mass testing program done, that's the way they want to um, make sure the virus is under control. Got to get hold of those uh, quick tests, though. That's going to be a big challenge. Emily, th thank you very much indeed. Emily Ashton joining us on the latest on UK politics. Let's get back to the markets now. How bad can the euro rate get? The pound's trading just north of 129 right now. Europe clearly facing harsh restrictions as we head towards Christmas. How do you balance that out as well with the risks of the US election? Let's talk about all of that now. Jordan Rochester, G10 FX strategist, joining us now from Nomura. So I've got a, a, a near 116 on euro dollar, and I've got the pound trading 129.05. Given the fact that the virus seems to be in control in Europe, do you see further downside for those pairs? Afternoon, Guy. Morning, Alex. Well, Guy, in the short term, I'm really short term, we're talking until tomorrow, I can see this sort of downward drift continuing. But if we break properly below the recent ranges of euro dollar, the question will be, is this going to be a new trend? And the answer from us is unlikely. It's not going to be a new trend. And that's because the US election on Tuesday and hopefully the results by Wednesday, Thursday would tell us quite a lot about the outlook. If we have a blue wave, if we see massive fiscal spending expectations pick up, the dollar is likely to weaken, Guy. And in that scenario, I can't see the recent lockdowns overwhelming that sort of euphoria from the fiscal expectations. We saw back in April and May and June how important it is for markets when they react to the fiscal stimulus and the monetary stimulus from policymakers. That actually matters more than the numbers of COVID-19 cases. Unfortunately, there is a difference between Main Street and Wall Street. And the assets that we're buying, uh, they got more money chasing too few assets. And the point I've, I've been making to clients just this morning and this afternoon is that this lockdown is quite different, Guy. We have, I know Angela Merkel was quoted there saying the light at the end of the tunnel is quite far away. 
well, actually, there is light at the end of the tunnel, which is we have better testing. We've got hopefully potential vaccines. I think back to March and April, we didn't have that anywhere near in terms of timelines. So I think there is a big difference this time around, Guy, from the first wave to the second wave. And if you think there's going to be a blue wave in this U.S. election, this is probably an opportunity to buy back euro, not sell it. I guess my question is, why is it a done deal that a blue wave would be negative for the dollar and that you can make the argument that you have more fiscal stimulus from the U.S. and a Fed that has a lot more room to move than the ECB and the BOJ, and that could actually be good for U.S. growth equals good uh, for assets from the U.S. is dollar positive? Absolutely, Alex. I agree. Um, the difference is the trade deficit for the U.S. is already starting from a very wide perspective. The double deficits of the U.S., which is the current account and the government balance, incredibly wide and the fed has actually not been buying up all of the issuance so far to date there's been an excess amount of u.s treasury issuance compared to europe and even the uk much more balanced sort of numbers where the central banks have stepped in and bought up most of the issuance so what you're left with alex is a world of excess dollars and typically when you get a big fiscal stimulus and monetary stimulus from the u.s that money leaks out of the u.s via the trade balance and benefits the rest of the world. You'll see higher imports, for example. So yes, completely agreed. You'll see higher growth expectations for the US, but you'll also see outflows from a financial account perspective that will lead to that dollar weaker trend. Jordan, key Senate races look very close. What happens if the Democrats do not take the Senate? Well, I think we're going to be doing an all-nighter tomorrow, basically. And one of the early Senate races, hopefully, is Georgia. If we see, I mean, Georgia's on my mind, essentially. If we don't, if we don't see that <laughs> flip to Democrats, we know that it's going to be a lot tougher for the Democrats to flip the entire Senate in their favor. So Georgia's on my mind. Florida, of course, like everybody else, following that key swing state. If the Democrats don't win the Senate, that is really messy. Um, and if let's imagine you have a Joe Biden presidency, but Republican Senate, in that scenario, we're talking them, Democrats again trying to get stimulus done, but the Senate dragging things out. There will be some form of stimulus, but the numbers will be much smaller, 500 billion to $1 trillion, where with a Democratic blue wave, we're hoping more to three to four in terms of the market multiples wow. that we're looking at. So the differences are quite vast. And in that scenario, it's risk off. It's euro dollar down to 114 sort of moves on the night, really, if you see that sort of outcome. Uh, on the night, what about after? Um, and I ask because I feel like with every big event over the last four years, the reaction function is a lot shorter. The biggest was when Trump surprised with his win in 2016, but that reversed too in like 24 hours. How long do you think these market moves are going to be in for? Yeah, Alex, it made a, a bit of a mockery of our profession, really, didn't it? <laughs> so Trump back in 2016 was risk off, and the dollar yen went lower, and the S&P futures went lower. And then about three hours later, everyone got their heads around the tax reforms, and the dollar went up and risk on everywhere else in terms of equity markets. This time around, I have asked the same question. Is the reaction function we're all talking about right now, is what I just said completely the opposite to what happens? <laughs> it's very possible if, for example, you get a blue wave, Big fiscal expectations, you see, risk on initially. But then if Joe Biden starts talking about raising taxes as fast as he can, the truth is he won't be able to raise them as fast as he can. He's not president until January in this scenario. And tax reform actually takes a while. And raising taxes won't be probably the first thing he does as president. But if that's his focus, and that's possibly the reason why you see risk off maybe in some sectors. If you see the Democrats start talking about reform and antitrust issues for technology, that's, again, another risk-off factor. Definitely, we've all considered it. I think the fact we're talking about it is a good thing. Where in 2016, I don't know if anyone was really talking about if Trump wins, it's risk on. It was pretty much before it's risk-off, it's risk-off, until the actual fact of the matter happened on the night. If Trump wins, I, is that the biggest volatility event here? It, it strikes me that the Senate is, is probably the worst-case scenario, but the market just doesn't seem to have... Trump winning priced in anywhere. Is Trump winning still the biggest surprise? I think so, Guy. I mean, CNH is one of the favored trades in the foreign exchange space, so lower dollar CNH. And that's on the back of the expectation that Joe Biden will be less aggressive to China with trade uh, tariffs and so forth. So if Trump was to win, that consensus trade would get hurt. You see big moves in CNH in that scenario just from the trade angle. Then you'd have the risk angle as well, which is the Democrats would still be likely to hold the House 
in that scenario. So you have a Trump presidency holding on to the Senate, for example, but the House still split. Since July, we were talking about phase four stimulus. It was quite exhausting every day, Pelosi and the Democrats and Mnuchin and Meadows talking about, we are looking to hopefully get a deal done. And here we are in November and it hasn't happened. The question guy will be how quickly they do a stimulus deal, phase four, and how big will it be? The Senate Republicans have actually held things back, trying to keep the size small to around $500 billion, even less in some examples. The question will be whether they suddenly change their opinion because Trump's won the presidency in that scenario. How quickly does phase four stimulus happen? That can kind of bring back the risk off we would see from the election. So yes, risk off on that outcome of a Trump presidency. But if you get a big phase four, one and a half, two trillion dollars, which is, is roughly where we thought it could have been back in July if it had gone through, that could solve that sort of risk off pattern. All right, Jordan, good luck on your overnight. I have, I, I'm imagining you guys with like a huge whiteboard with like the 75 different probabilities and like how you trade uh, over the next 48 hours. Good luck with that. Jordan Rochester, G10 FX, the strategist at Nomura. All right, coming up is the road ahead for transatlantic trade relations. We're going to speak with Sir David Manning, former UK ambassador to the United States. This is Bloomberg. In lockdown, no, for four weeks or possibly more in the run up to Christmas to implementing it for two weeks when Sage first went leaders were actually better at controlling the deaths from COVID-19. Do you think out of this pandemic, we'll see more countries be willing to elect female leaders? When we look at women leaders, we tend to project on them baggage that they shouldn't bear. Women are given an opportunity when no one else wants to do the job. Women had a very clear objective. Uh, they wanted to save lives. The women leaders if you look at their careers, have also built up a level of, of trust. In fact, women have to be better at communication in order to be elected uh, as leaders, whereas this doesn't hold true for men. We need to get those sexist stereotypes out of our head and give women a fair run for leadership. Trying to change the stereotypes about women is not only the business of women, but men have to be part of it. Check in on the Bloomberg First Word News now. I'm Ritika Gupta. The new lockdowns make it almost certain that the Bank of England will come up with more monetary stimulus this week. Central bank watchers had already expected the BOE to boost its bond buying program. Prime Minister Boris Johnson's month-long lockdown means the economy will face a third quarter of decline this year. And Brexit negotiators are moving closer to breaking the impasse over one of the biggest obstacles to a trade deal. A compromise is emerging on the issue of what access boats from the EU will have to British fishing waters. The potential solution would allow Britain to claim it has won back control of its seas. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg, Guy. Thank you very much indeed, Ritika. So UK negotiators say trade talks with the United States have actually reached advanced stages in most areas. They said the two nations are in a good position to move forward after the US election. The question is, who's going to win? Joining us now, Sir David Manning former UK ambassador 
to the United States. So, David, thank you very much, Steve, for your time today. Let's start off with the big picture question, and then we'll get down into the details of a potential trade deal. Is a Biden win bad news for the UK? No, I think a Biden win would be good news for the UK. And I'll tell you why. It's because his approach to international relations is much more sympathetic to the British approach than that of Donald Trump. The Trump presidency has been a period of America first. Uh, he is a president who is obviously suspicious of multilateral institutions and multilateral approaches, whereas everything we know about Joe Biden suggests that he's the reverse, that he has always supported a multilateral approach to global issues, and he has been a supporter of multilateral institutions. And that is very much where Britain is. Uh, Britain is a keen supporter of multilateral institutions and approaches and sees its national interests as being furthered by uh, those methods, not by, as it were, nationalist um, go-it-alone policies. So I think that the a Biden presidency for the United Kingdom would be a positive. Um, okay, let's pick that apart a little bit. Uh, Boris Johnson, the British Prime Minister, formed a very close relationship with the current incumbent of the White House, Mr. Trump. I wonder whether that will, will work against the UK. Uh, we also saw under the Obama administration, and I wonder whether or not this will be continued uh, under a Joe Biden presidency, that Obama favored Berlin over London. So I'm wondering whether or not the UK's relationship with Washington in terms of the priorities may be downgraded. Well, I think Britain may have to face up to that. Um, certainly when I was working in the United States, and I think since, it has always been the case that American presidents and Washington generally has seen Britain's role in the EU as an important component in the bilateral relationship that valued the fact that we've been in Europe and able to influence the debates there. Now, of course, there's a whole range of issues that are bilateral and not uh, dependent on our membership of the EU. But I don't think it's any secret that uh, certainly the Biden camp would much have preferred Britain to stay in the European Union. And I think if, if Joe Biden becomes president, uh, he is likely to see the EU as a more important interlocutor, interlocutor overall than, than London. Now, that doesn't mean to say that suddenly the relationship with Britain doesn't matter. I think there will be all sorts of areas where we will clearly be working closely together. Some of them will be in general approach, and I mentioned this attitude to a multilateral view of the world, which we would certainly share with the Biden presidency. But we will be much closer to uh, Joe Biden than we would have been or will be with a, a second Trump presidency when it comes to issues like climate change, um, when it comes to the management of pandemics, and both of those areas where Britain has a, 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 a leading role to play, I think, and certainly sees a, glo a global approach as the answer. And absolutely critically for us in this country, we attach enormous importance to the security relationship. And that transcends the bilateral relationship, although that's very important, our close relations on intelligence, on the military, and so on. But the bedrock for Britain has, since the late 1940s, been the NATO alliance. And I think that that, that is not suddenly going to change uh, if, if, if Joe Biden becomes president. On the, on the contrary, he has made it clear that he believes in the alliance, and that would be very welcome in London, whoever is prime minister, and um, particularly if uh, we are to, to gather that uh, a, a, another Trump presidency might put America's commitment to NATO at risk. And this was what John Bolton seemed to suggest in his book, which gives an account of his time as national security advisor under President Trump. And this would be enormously unwelcome to Britain. So, yes, I think that the United States will probably put uh, the EU, uh, give it greater priority uh, than it has done in the past, and that we will be missing from that. But there will be other elements that are very important mm -hmm. in the bilateral relationship, such as security, and I think that those will be anchors for, for the London-Washington relationship. Ambassador, 
Uh, I wonder how Brexit winds up playing into this. Uh, Joe Biden has already said uh, that if there will be no U.S.-U.K. trade deal, if Britain goes back on its treaty, it's signed with the EU, he as well as Nancy Pelosi have talked about the relationship with Northern Ireland and how those can be deal breakers as well. Um, how do you think this conversation plays out? Well, I think it is a very important element. Um, I take it very seriously, and I don't think it's empty talk. I think we should take very seriously the a message that has come from Joe Biden and from those around him, and indeed from the Democratic Party leadership, that if there is, let's say, a no-Brexit deal that in any way undermines or jeopardizes the Good Friday Agreement, then there will be no free trade, agree uh, free trade agreement with Britain. Um, it is enormously important, clearly, to, uh, to Joe Biden and those around him that this, this agreement, which took so much negotiating, which I remember so vividly um, from my own time in Washington and how important American support for it was, that this should not be undermined, that we do not want to go back to a period when the relationship in Northern Ireland was the period of the Troubles. So I think we need to take that very seriously, and uh, I think that's, that's something that actually transcends uh, the, the result of this election, because I think it would affect the way Congress viewed any FTA, whoever is in the White House, whether it's the second Trump term or whether it's Joe Biden. Well, let's just deal with the details of, of such an FTA. The, the UK Department of International Trade today, this morning, said uh, that it believes that it is in a, quote, good position to move forward after the election, regardless uh, of uh, almost who wins, seem to be the kind of the infer uh, inference from it. Uh, do you think that's the case? Do you think a deal that has been negotiated pre-election, say we were to see a transfer of power in the United States to Joe Biden, that, it, that, that such a deal could simply be Bidenized uh, and maybe different emphasis placed on different bits, but once the, the kind of the building blocks are in place that we can move forward? Or do you think you almost have to start again? Look, I, I don't know the answer to that because I'm not party to the negotiations and I don't know how close we are to resolving the outstanding difficulties. Uh, before sort of attempting to give you a view, I do come back to what I just said to Alex, which is whether or not there is, let's call it an oven-ready deal, if by any chance that deal falls foul of the Brexit negotiations, it won't go through, So it can, in my view. So it can be as ready as it likes, but there is a second element to this, and we have got to be sure that whatever deal we do with uh, the European Union is compatible with the Northern Ireland uh, Good Friday Agreement. As to whether, if that, you put that on one side and that is all straightforward, as we hope it would be, um, whether it is then... Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I'm placing an order to sell short euro at 116,365. 116,365. Okay, order place to sell short. Let's see. The British government to uh, ride roughshod over public sensibilities over this. Now, if it is a, a Trump re-election scenario, yep. um, we are told that he wants to press ahead with this, but we have been told this for a long time. And certainly so it was the ambition earlier this year that this deal would be done quite quickly. Well, it hasn't been so far. And yep. as to the Joe Biden situation, well, if he's president, you know, what are his priorities? So um, David. I, I suspect he would like to do the deal with us, but we know, and I've been listening to some of your other contributors, domestic issues are going to weigh yep. very, very heavily in the scale. So, David, we will leave it there. We New short position open for euro at 
The time has come to elect the next president of the United States, and the stakes could not be higher. Two candidates, two very different paths for the future of the country. I'm David Weston. We will bring you the results as they unfold live on election night. Join us Tuesday, November 3rd at 7 p.m. Eastern Time on Bloomberg Television and Radio. to close European markets. They are near session highs. They are bouncing back from the big losses that we saw last week. We are still down over the last five days by 2 to 3%. Uh, we have seen volatility also come a little lower today. Curves are flattening on both sides of the Atlantic, but critically, euro dollar and the cable rate are both trading near very pivotal levels, uh, particularly for the uh, single currency around that 116 level. Anyway, today at least equity markets catching a bit into the critical US election. The details to follow. This is Bloomberg. Best, your weekly review of the most important business news analysis and interviews from Bloomberg Television around the world. Ken Burns. Stop on profit for euro at 116.345. Okay. I'm placing a stop on profit 116.345. What is one word of advice you'll take with you? Learn how to listen. And that is certainly something that has served me well. Ankiti, where do you go from here? It's a huge market. It's a huge opportunity. I want to go 100x from here. Our philosophy is to partner where we can and stand apart when we should. of the factory of the world, but a very big opportunity to compete in being the office of the world. Stocks wrapping up the day here in Europe. 30 seconds to go until the end of regular trading. Let's take a look at what the session looks like. Stock 600 bouncing back. We're finishing near session highs today. We're up by around 1.5%. But this comes clearly on the back of the significant selling that we saw towards the tail end of last week. In fact, for most of last week. Uh, and we are seeing volatility come down as well. So a little bit of a calming of equity markets in advance 
of the US election. I have to say that anecdotally, it seems that many people are not carrying significant positions, risk positions into that election. Uh, and it's uh, maybe some evidence to suggest that that's what last week was really about. As I say, volatility coming down a little bit as well. Uh, but we did climb throughout most of October uh, up to recent peaks, which is fading that move a little bit. Be interesting to see whether that carries on over the next 24, 48 hours. That's going to be one of the big trades certainly to watch out for. Uh, in terms of the other trades that we're watching so carefully at the moment, euro dollar front and center, we're trading at critical levels. We're down a little bit again today. We're trading just north of that 116 handle. We were talking to Jordan Rochester a little bit earlier on. If you don't get the blue wave, if you say, for instance, see Joe Biden win the White House, but the Republicans holding on to the Senate, he was suggesting you could see that number going down to around 114. So keep an eye on this pair to work our way through again the next 24, 48 hours. In terms of the individual markets around Europe, uh, a little bit of dispersion, but not much. The FTSE 100 underperforming a little bit. The CAC aren't outperforming a little bit. Uh, with stocks like uh, Lafarge doing very well around Europe, the construction sector's done very well. But actually, in broad terms, what we've seen is the travel sector underperforming today, but there are some notable standouts. So let's talk about some of the single stocks that we're watching. Ryanair is one of them. Seems to be, from a stock point of view, at least today, kind of cruising above the COVID cloud that is uh, really dragging everything else uh, in its wake at the moment. Ryanair trading up by 4.65%. Uh, the numbers today were okay. Michael O'Leary, the CEO, delivering uh, a good set of numbers, the boss over there. Um, he is talking about a positive outlook if we are to see a vaccine, but nevertheless, in the near term at least, uh, it's going to be a very tough winter, and even, even uh, this company can't avoid that. Ocado, the home delivery company, deals with Kroger over in the United States, for instance, trading up very strongly, one of the best performers out of Europe today. Uh, not only in terms of an upgrade for the numbers, it's also buying a robotics company. Uh, remember, that is essentially what this is. It's basically a technology company, so that's a robotics company, uh, augmenting that today with an acquisition. Uh, and Lafarge, Lafarge Holcim, uh, I brought that up a little bit earlier, uh, trading up by 4.35%. The outlook looking fairly good. Um, you would have thought actually the construction sector would be on the back foot considering what the narrative we're getting today, but the company uh, posting a positive sort of story going forward. Uh, and you've got to think about maybe we are going to see some of the stimulus being turned into capital stock. And you would have thought at some point Lafarge Holcim in the construction sector would be a beneficiary of that. Alex. Well, all of this set in the backdrop of the resurgence virus and then lockdowns in Europe as well. So that leads us to COVID treatments. Well, biotech company Tiziana Life Sciences will start clinical trials tomorrow. It's developing a treatment that could be nasally, nasally administered. Its founder and chairman, Gabriele Tironi, uh, joins us now. Gabriele, what uh, are you offering? What's the treatment? Walk us through the specific. So, uh, Alex, today is a big milestone for Tiziana Life Sciences for three reasons. One, it's the first time that we are entering a human trial for, for efficacy and proof of concept of our monoclonal antibody for Malulab in COVID-19 patients in Brazil. Uh, the second reason is it is the first time that a monoclonal antibody will be administered nasally as traditionally all monoclonal antibodies have been given uh, intravenously by injection. So it's, a, it's the first time that this is ever going to be done. And we think that this can provide a major advantage in treating COVID-19 patients as you can act locally and uh, attack the cytokine storm, which is uh, present in the respiratory tract in lungs and which leads to uh, mortality. The third reason we're excited is that we are going to be um, running an arm of the trial with foralumab isolated by itself. But in addition to that, we're going to be combining it with dexamethasone, which is a, a, a well-known steroid which has been used very commonly in the last six months as part of COVID cocktails, including the one that was used to treat President Trump last month. So, so we're very excited about um, uh, running that uh, together with de dexamethasone. And, uh, and isolated as part of my lab itself. What type of patients would this be appropriate for, Gabrielli? So, so what are, are the, we are, are enrolling three arms, um, 36 patients, minimum 60 maximum. And the idea is to, to um, have one set of patients that are controlled um, without any drug one with our monoclonal antibody, and then the third with a monoclonal antibody plus dexamethasone. And the idea is to try to prevent uh, patients going uh, onto respirators by the use of our, our treatment. 
Uh, if, if things go okay and, and efficacy moves forward, when does this treatment sort of hit on mass? So the idea of the proof of concept trial is to, is to see if we see any positive efficacy in the trial. And once that is achieved, we will enroll a bigger trial where we, we will be able to measure whether we can get an FDA approval. So the idea of this trial is to get quick results. In fact, it's designed so that we will know by the end of December 2020, so by Christmas time, whether there is a, a positive result in the administration of formalulab and with dexamethasone. So um, the idea is now that we've seen that it was safe in our previous trial reported last year in healthy volunteers, we now test it to see if it works in improving uh, the status of COVID-19 patients. Once that is achieved, and if that is achieved, we will enroll a much bigger trial. Gabriele, at what point would a patient receive this single treatment or cocktail treatment with dexamethasone? Would it be as they entered hospital? Would it be before they go on to, to respiration? I, I'm curious as to uh, at what point in the, in the process that it would be applied. So, so, um, so, um, obviously, on the um, first arm, we we enroll um, we enroll COVID patients which get no drug treatment. On, on the second and third arm, the idea would be to before they go to a uh, respirator to give them the, when the, the symptoms uh, progress in a negative fashion, we would put them on the dexamethasone plus uh, for Maglidab trial. What do you think is the relationship going forward between treatment and a vaccine? There's a lot of questions as to how long a vaccine will be good for, how many shots you have to get, uh, and how then treatments wind up interacting with all of it. Well, you know, I've been a big, big um, believer in that, uh, that drug therapies are essential um, in parallel to, to vaccine treatment because uh, we, we believe that um, drug, drug therapies are necess necessary for all the population that will not be vaccinated. And for, for the anti-vaccine believers, um, there needs to be a drug treatment in parallel. And we're big believers that uh, cocktails, where you could attack the viral part of the COVID-19 virus, as well as what transpires when you have the infection, which is the attack on your immune system through an excessive cytokine storm which attacks your respiratory cyst tract and lungs. So we, we believe that the best path forward is combining drugs together, which attacks separately the virus and uh, the cytokine storm. What else could this be used for? Well, with this, this, this um, technology and therapy that we're um, testing in Brazil could also be used for acute respiratory distress syndrome and, and MERS as well. Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. So we believe that if this showed success, it would be a useful therapy beyond COVID-19 because ARDS has been, a, uh, has been with us way before the COVID pandemic and it'll be around way after the COVID pandemic. Um, in addition, um, uh, Guy, we have been developing as our lead indication with Formalia Lab a treatment for progressive multiple sclerosis. And we would be initiating a phase two trial in the first half of 2021 in progressive multiple sclerosis patients. And, and so the, the um, ability to expand formalulab in other um, autoimmune diseases such as uh, Crohn's disease, um, type one diabetes is massive. And we hope to be able to uh, achieve the success of drugs such as Humira, which are monoclonal antibodies that have achieved 20 billion in revenue per annum. And what we have that is an advantage is we can be delivered orally and nasally. And all monoclonal antibodies up until today have only been delivered by injection. So th this trial is gonna be a, a launching pad to, to test efficacy and also the gateway to expanding um, into multiple sclerosis, um, even Alzheimer's and Crohn's disease. We wish you good luck, Gabriele Cironi of Tiziana. Thank you very much indeed.
Let's check where European stocks have settled. Positive session for European equities. These are the final numbers. A little bit of a dip down during the auction process and not much to speak about. Uh, as you can see, a positive, positive session. We'll carry on the coverage post-game here in Europe at the top of the hour on Bloomberg Radio with The Cable Show. John Farrow and me. This is Bloomberg. Just days away from the most critical election in U.S. history, and it's only democracy at stake. From electronic voting machines to misinformation and fake news and political advertising on social media, is the tech industry ready for its biggest test yet? I'm Emily Chang, and we'll be focusing on these issues all week on Bloomberg Technology in a special electioneering series. Tune in 5 p.m. Eastern, 2 p.m. Pacific, only on Bloomberg Television. I think what we've seen during this period of time is that communicating via video is not a fad. That we are using it in all aspects of our lives, for work, for learning, for communicating, for staying in touch. Let's check in on the Foot Bloomberg First Word News now. I'm Rishka Gupta. Joe Biden has a seven percentage point lead in the battleground state of Pennsylvania. That's according to one of the final polls of the campaign. A Monmouth University poll out today has Biden ahead of the President Trump, 51 to 44 in Pennsylvania. Both candidates are campaigning there today. And President Trump is suggesting he may fire infectious diseases chief Anthony Fauci after the election. Over the weekend, Fauci told the Washington Post the U.S. is, quote, in for a whole lot of hurt from the coronavirus this winter. There were chants of fire Fauci at a Trump rally in Florida last night, and the president hinted he may do that once the election is over. 
Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. Alex. All right, thanks so much, Ritika. So let's get to how uh, we're positioned here uh, for the election. Standard Charter actually wrote a note that said, uh, we continue to believe that sector-specific policies notwithstanding the U.S. presidential election outcomes are likely to be positive for risk assets in the medium term. Joining us now, Stuart Kaiser, UBS, head of equity derivatives uh, strategy. Hey, Stuart, help me square all these pegs. What do you do over the next, like, 24 hours? And do you think that no matter who wins, like Senator Trader does, you're in a bullish mood for, th for stocks? Oh, look, I mean, the next 24 hours, I think some of us will be hiding under our kitchen tables probably. But um, otherwise, you know, our view on the election is just, you know, the, the pullback we've had the last week has probably rebalanced things a little bit. Um, you know, coming into the, to the, to the election before that, it did feel like the market was probably a little bit bullishly, too bullish. Okay, position closed on euro, as you can see, at 116.345. We have 200 pounds in profit. Our stimulus package would kind of arise there. So I think you will get a generalized risk relief just to have the event behind us. But, you know, to the extent that the outcome, you know, makes it look like we might not get the size of stimulus the market is hoping for, in that case, you know, I don't think it's necessarily bullish from a tactical perspective. So I, I do think there's still a little bit of two-sided risk here, um, though the odds are probably skewed to the upside. I do still think you have that outcome that could be negative to markets, and, and that's why risk is priced the way it is. Stuart, what happens if the Biden win turns into a lots of talk about tax rises? The market is firmly focused on the stimulus side of the equation, but not talking about the revenue raising side. Yeah, and, and I think that is, you know, that's definitely a risk. And I, I think most equity investors over the summer were much more focused on the, the downside risk from tax policy as opposed to the upside risk from stimulus. And since then, what we've had is, is U.S. economic data going a little bit sideways, and then obviously now the potential for more lockdowns, that that stimulus has kind of become almost more of a necessary condition than it was. Um, you know, my impression from talking to investors is that there's a view that you'll get the stimulus now, but that the Democrats may push off the potential um, the potential changes in tax policy you know for let's say six to 12 months to allow the economy to recover so I think the the risk aspect from a tax policy um, change uh, from an investors perspective will be that it happens quicker than they expect I think most people expect it to happen but I think there's sort of a growing consensus that it'll get pushed out a little further in the future uh, to allow the economy to recover so I think it's much more a timing um, than a magnitude for that one Hey, Stuart, I know you said you want to hide under your bed for the next 24 hours, but uh, in terms of the market, how are we positioned here? Like, have positions been squared up? Are there any big bets on in the market right now? Are people, like, sitting in cash? What's happening? Um, you know, I would say positioning has kind of cleaned up a little bit, and I think you can see that in the price action. You know, you've seen you've seen the markets pull, pull back a little bit. You've seen some of those tech leaders come under a little bit of pressure. Um, you know, the, the flows we've seen from an options perspective, I think, have been more um, to the hedging side. So in that sense, I, I do think the last week has, has been people positioning for that, that risk outcome, you know, just in case. And, and that's the pattern that you've got at, gotten ahead of previous elections since 1990, which is you tend to get about a week ahead of the election. The VIX tends to kind of move a little bit higher as people start to trade that, you know, that risk. Um, so, yeah, you know, I do think it's cleaned up a little bit. Um, what I, how I would describe it is I think the headlines have probably been more bullish than the positioning has been over the course of the last month. You know, maybe more talk about stimulus and more talk about about a value rally um, and potentially less positioning actually behind that. So in that sense, once the election passes, I think there's, you know, the opportunity here for, for some of those headlines to turn into positioning, uh, which will be bullish for markets. Stuart, I've covered a few at U.S. elections, and the market always seems to get it wrong. <laughs> Why do you think this time could be different? Oh, <laughs> It's a good question. I mean, I think what's what's different this time is, frankly, how long we've been talking about it. Um, in, in the sense that you know, we were getting questions about the election when when people were wondering what to do if Warren got elected president. You know, 12 months ago. So you know, to your point, I think you know maybe we've we've talked about it too much and sort of overthought it. And to me, that's what happened a, a few weeks ago. Is as people step back and said, look, you know, regardless of the election, we're probably going to get a large stimulus package. We're probably going to get a vaccine announcement, and and the Fed is certainly. Behind 
behind the market. So I, you know, that, that is, I think, the more simplistic way to think about it is just the election's going to pass. We're going to get stimulus. We're going to get vaccine. And in that sense, I just need to be bullish going into into 2021. You know, what happened last week was, you know, I think I think the re-lockdown news, particularly in Germany, where Merkel had kind of committed not to do that, um, you know, really kind of threw people for a loop a little bit. And then I think you also had people just last minute saying, you know, what if this is 2016 and the polls don't show up the way that I, I expect them to? So I think I think the market is going to be if you where would the market be, excuse me, be wrong? And I think it's just the degree of risk that's been priced in is just, you know, incredibly, incredibly large. And to Alex's point, this, this could just be a. You know, a, maybe not a non-event, but but certainly not event as as large as the market has uh, has talked itself into over the last couple of months. Okay, we're going to wrap it up there. Stuart, always appreciate your insight. Thanks for joining us today, Stuart Kaiser of UBS. This is Bloomberg. were actually better at controlling the deaths from COVID-19. Do you think out of this pandemic, we'll see more countries be willing to elect female leaders? When we look at women leaders, we tend to project on them baggage that they shouldn't bear. Women are given an opportunity when no one else wants to do the job. Women have a very clear objective. Uh, they wanted to save lives. The women leaders if you look at their careers, have also built up a level of, of trust. In fact, women have to be better at communication in order to be elected uh, as leaders, whereas this doesn't hold true for men. We need to get those sexist stereotypes out of our head and give women a fair run for leadership. Trying to change the stereotypes about women is not only the business of women, but men have to be part of it. I am David Weston. Bloomberg Television is reinventing one of the most iconic brands in financial television for a new audience. Join me to see the news program for the clever investor. This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. We explore the trends, investments, and competition of the European ETF industry. Join us on Bloomberg ETF IQ Europe. So less than 24 hours to go until election day. The Democratic candidate, Joe Biden, leading President Trump in polls nationally and in several key swing states. Joining us now from West Des Moines, Iowa, for more on polling is Ann Seltzer, Seltzer & Company president. She's been a pollster for over 30 years and is something of a specialist <laughs> on Iowa. So the latest polls I read from you suggest that President Trump is going to win and win big in Iowa. How big is he going to win? And how significant is that? Well, well, our poll has him up seven. And so with a margin of error of 3.4%, I'm not sure that a poll like that would say it's necessarily a big win. But we did show him at about that level in 2016, and he won the state with nine points. So I just have to begin this conversation by using the word uncertainty, which this is its impossible to look backward and really sort of forecast what's going to happen in the future, given there's so many changes in voter turnout, and that is being fueled by early voting on a massive scale, and of course the unprecedented amount of money. Campaigns wanted for nothing. So if they use their money wisely, um, you know, we ha there are all sorts of ways to shake up these races yet. So, Ann, let's get to that, because uh, something that came out over the weekend was that some within the Biden campaign are worried about uh, Latino turnout as well as African Americans, that those that have registered have not yet come out to pre-vote. Um, walk me through what you know there. Well, we in Iowa, we do not have registration by race, so there's no way to really track that on a, on a formal basis. There are probably indicators and people who have 
voter files where they've overlaid what they think is happening there. We certainly have seen in uh, other polling that we've done some indication that. Now I am buying euro. I'm placing an order to buy at 116.34. Okay, order place to buy at 116.34. to me is is the key indicator so when we've got turnout at this massive level don't yet know exactly how that's going to fall by race or even by age that much because there's just so much of it going on what about gender Anne? yeah well we have seen consistently in iowa a, 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 i hate to use the word gigantic but it was <laughs> a gender gap with women uh preferring Joe Biden in double digits, you know, into the plus 20 margin kind of error, but balanced on the other side with men preferring President Trump. And we now see that the men vote is sticking with that kind of imbalance, but the women's vote has narrowed a bit, still favoring Joe Biden and still by a healthy margin. But long position open at 116.34. Let me I'll remove this because we already executed this position. Okay. And now this is long. And one sixteen thirty four. Okay. David Wesson on balance of power on Bloomberg Television and radio. Uh, don't miss that. Uh, within the markets, a very different story today uh, than it was on Friday. 1.3% uh, upside there uh, for the S&P as the euro still trades a little bit heavy uh, and bonds pretty much go nowhere. This is Bloomberg. Oftentimes we have to turn to our neighbor and turn to people within our community to assist us, to help us. The Oakland African American Resiliency Relief Program was created to support and fund uh, black owned businesses in the city of Oakland. The reason we started this fund due to the systemic racism behind the PPP funds, uh, also how our black owned businesses have been marginalized for so long.
institutions, particularly, you know, sort of the technology landscape, have gotten to some pretty extraordinary uh, levels. Uh, so I think it's, it's not a surprise. I don't think it's any indication of the beginning of the end, but I do think markets don't like uncertainty. This is a market that over the past few weeks has made it clear it wants to go higher. It got a little spooked by the idea that geopolitical potential are rising. From Bloomberg World Headquarters in New York to our TV and radio audiences worldwide, I'm David Weston. Welcome to Balance of Power, where the world of politics meets the world of business. We are just 18 hours away from polls opening on the east coast of the United States, and already over 95 million Americans have cast their vote, either early in person or by mail. To bring us up to speed on this Election Day Eve, we turn to our chief Washington correspondent, Kevin Cerilli. It's not just Election Day Eve, it's your birthday, as I understand it, Kevin. <laughs> so happy birthday. But give us a sense of what these candidates are doing today. One day to go. Well, thank you. It's a marathon, not a sprint. But today it is a sprint up until when the first polls open uh, tomorrow on Election Day. Uh, Democratic presidential nominee Joe Biden spending his time, David, in the Keystone State, Pennsylvania, where his campaign is headquartered. He's also going to be making a last-ditch effort to try to turn Ohio, get this, Ohio, back to blue. This, of course, have been trending, a state that have been trending Dem uh, Republican uh, for quite some time, and Democrats now feel that they might have Ohio in play. President Trump barnstorming across the country, North Carolina, a key state, a key Senate race, mind you, also going to be making stops in Florida, in Pennsylvania, Iowa, where he's trying to give a lift to Senator Joni Ernst, an incumbent Republican in the Senate. So all of this comes at a time in which there are now new reports about how both of the candidates will be spending their election night. I spoke with a source close to the president's re-election campaign earlier this morning, David, who told me that the president will be having a very close circle of prominent notable names surrounding him on election night at the White House, where he likely could give some type of national address. Uh, whether or not he declares victory, whether or not Joe Biden declares victory, we don't know. But the president uh, suggesting that he is preparing his team for there to be not just uh, a wide, a, a long night ahead of them, but a long several days after the election. David? Yeah, we're talking about election week, aren't we, Kevin? Thank yep. you so much. Look forward to spending that week with you, Kevin Cerulli, <laughs> our chief Washington correspondent. W through the, th with us throughout the election coverage this year has been our Bloomberg political contributor, Jeannie Zeno. She's professor of political science at Iona College. She's back with us now. Jeannie, great to have you with us. So uh, day before, give us a sense of what you're looking at. Set the stage. Well, I'm exhausted hearing Kevin just talk about what the candidates are doing because it is quite a marathon. And, uh, you know, the president in particular, just after COVID, to be doing this many big rallies outside, it's quite incredible. But I think, you know, what I'm looking for as we move into election night, number one, is to see, does Joe Biden break into any of those Sunbelt states? I think if he does, particularly those states that count early, like a Florida, like a Georgia, like a North Carolina, um, I'm not expecting he will, but if he does, I think that would bode problematic for the president. But if the president is able to hold those, as he was in 2016, this then moves into the Midwestern states. So we're particularly looking, obviously, at Pennsylvania. And they, of course, are not going to be releasing results, we expect, on election night. So to your point, we could then be looking at a few days, if not more, before we know the results of this. Yeah, a terribly important point. We're all going to have to be patient, I think, tomorrow night, without a doubt. <laughs> uh, Jeannie, this is a, an event election like no other, with given the number of people who voted early, voting by absentee ballot. Another difference, though, I wonder is how stubborn the polls have been. There's been that margin of Vice President Biden at, over President Trump pretty stubbornly throughout. If, in fact, because of the energy, as you describe it, President Trump is bringing to this and the barns are in the, if it turns around, what does that mean for polling in this country? It's such a good question. Um, you know, we sort of, pollsters had egg on their face in 2016. I'm not so sure it was warranted, but with all the predictions that Clinton would win by 80, 90 percent and then for her to lose, that was problematic. Of course, if it happens again, I think we as an industry are really going to have to go back and see where we are going wrong. I think the important thing to keep in mind, and Anne was just on talking about it, these polls are all within a margin of error. So 
if we're looking at something like Pennsylvania at four or five percent for Biden in a margin of error of three or four percent, that means it's pretty much neck and neck. So I think we have to keep that in mind. In these states that are tight, we could see the president pull it out as he did in 2016. And I want to come back to the question of how long we have to wait, because as we've discussed before, depending on the state, you could have early returns coming in favoring President Trump and then turning around or vice versa. For example, between Pennsylvania and Florida, it's very different in when those absentee ballots get counted. Yeah, absolutely. And it's a, on a state by state basis in terms of when they start counting and how long they're accepting ballots. So, you know, I think this was some of the concern people had over the weekend listening to the president say he might declare victory on election night if it's close before all of the ballots are counted. And I think what we'd be looking at in that case would be a whole lot of litigation on both sides. And of course, that's almost a worst case scenario, not just for people watching this election closely like we are, but for Americans as a whole, because it raises all kinds of questions of social unrest, potentially rioting and violence and those kinds of things. So that would be an almost worst case scenario, sort of a 2000 on speed where we'd had that across several states potentially. It's not just the president that we're electing, but also a third of the Senate. And there's a real question whether the Senate could switch back to Democrat or not. How realistic is that, do you think, right now? You know, 10 months ago, 11 months ago, we would have said not really likely. But at this point, it is absolutely possible Democrats take the Senate. And I think it's so important to watch that and to talk about it. Do Democrats only need to pick up three seats if, if Biden wins? They need to pick up four if he loses, and they will control the Senate. And there's a lot of close races out there, Republicans defending many more seats than Democrats are. And so Democrats really have a shot to take this. So, you know, we're watching states from Maine, for instance, with Susan Collins, where the spending and ad spending, and we understand, has been $26 million in ad spending alone, which is quite incredible. And, you know, you're looking at big spending across the country on these Senate races because it's a really important prospect of Democrats taking the Senate at this point. And, Jeannie, if we didn't have enough troubles, we may not know the result, as I understand, the Senate either. This is something you spotted, actually. We have, of course, two Senate races in Georgia because there's one special election, and they have to get more than 50 percent to get elected. You could have runoffs in one or even two Senate seats in Georgia alone. Yeah, absolutely. So we have Loeffler and Purdue. Both of those seats are up. And if neither, you know, if in either race they don't get over 50, as you mentioned, it goes to a runoff and we could potentially not know who controls the Senate until January, in which case we're going to see a lot of money pour into Georgia to continue funding these campaigns. I think we're all hoping it doesn't happen in both. But at this point, looking at the polls, it's a real possibility down there. And of course, in Maine, you have the ranked choice voting, and that can also put a wrinkle in terms of how that comes out for Susan Collins, the incumbent there. Yeah, a lot of possibilities to prepare for. Thank you so much to Jeannie Zeno, Iona College professor and Bloomberg contributor. She'll be with us tomorrow night for that election coverage. And now let's get check on the markets. Joining us now is Abigail Doolittle. So when I looked a little earlier, it looked like people were buying pretty much everything, Abigail. Yeah, real risk on day here, at least relative to stocks. Commodities a little bit less so, but we have big gains for both the Dow and the S&P 500. The Nasdaq less so. I'm not sure that it has so much to do with the election. Last Friday, there were some saying that perhaps last Friday could turn out to be the pre-election low, similar to 2016, when you had the two weeks into the election, uh, down weeks, and then you had a big rally uh, in the election week and out of the election. What's very clear, though, is we have lots of selling in the tech space. That probably has to do with J.P. Morgan saying that they're lightening up on their overweighting uh, tech uh, positioning to a neutral. They expect some of the more cyclical uh, sectors to take hold, and that has nothing to do with the election. They think that will happen no matter who wins uh, the presidency. What they do say, though, is, and this is not surprising, uh, that what investors really want relative to the election is certainty, uh, that they want to know who is uh, going to win this election, and that once that's in place, that's going to be a real positive uh, for the markets. And one sign of that uncertainty that you and Jeannie and Kevin were just talking about, bonds. We actually have bonds rallying in a big way on the day after selling off last week. 
Never a dull moment, David. Yeah, Abigail, it isn't. But one thing you follow, I know, is positioning. Is that telling us anything? Are people hedging? What's going on with the VIX? Uh, the VIX is actually down just slightly today, but the VIX continues to suggest that, yes, investors are hedging into the election. The VIX has been outpacing the VXN or the tech index VIX, which is pretty interesting because it, again, suggests that relative to regular volatility as opposed to that mega cap volatility, investors are starting to bring up the hedge in terms of anything can happen. And something else that I've been watching over the last few months, the S&P 500 stuck in this huge range of conge congestion. Uh, and there's one uh, line of thinking that says that if in the three months ahead of the election, the stock market is up, that supports the incumbent. If it is down, that supports uh, the contender. David, right now it's on the wire, suggesting that the <laughs> markets are far more uncertain about the outcome of this election uh, than the polls are. Yeah, exactly. The polls may not be reliable. We'll, we'll find out soon enough. Thank you so much, Abigail. That's Abigail Doolittle reporting on the markets. Coming up, we're going to talk with the former political director for the California Republican Party, Mike Madrid, about the key question of the Latino vote. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio.
retailer Farfetch is betting it can shape the future. This is its concept store, showcasing the latest in retail tech. How do you capture all of that fantastic information that you gather in store with customers' touch and feel products? And we created a concept called the Connected Rail. And this is using a combination of RFID and ultrasound. The RFID signal uh, recognizes the product, and the ultrasound recognizes the movement. Take the product off, and then you'll start to see your products appear. And essentially, it's like online browsing behavior. Whichever products you touch and pick up in the store are automatically sent to your app. This is effectively what you've created, is your in-store wish list. In the middle, you'll see essentially a hologram of the product. What the customer sees, they, they control the experience on um, a touch device. What this allows the customer to do is take uh, elements of products and then add their own style to it. Right, so this is the connected mirror. So in this example, I see my products. I select a coat, and that's tried it, and it's slightly too big for me. So what I can do is choose an alternative size and send a request to the sales associate, and they'll bring that size to me in the fitting room mirror. You'll also see that we've got some product recommendations here. Crucially, the sales associate's able to push items into the mirror from their device. If you wanted to, you could simply use the mirror and pay and go. Your items would then be packed and dispatched to you afterwards. Do you want me to turn you so you're looking outwards? Yes, please. How about 
there. First time we came out with B, Jade said it feels like I've been released from prison. Do you want these, missus? Definitely. Definitely. <laughs> right. Yeah. And she could say hello to everybody, people she hadn't seen for months. It's Jade. Oh, it's Jade. Oh. So you can talk to Jade through this. Hi, Katie. She's there. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Every time anyone's seen her, they want to know why she's there. And it's kind of the opposite of when you're in a wheelchair and people see you and they kind of go, oh, um, should I look? I don't know. I don't know what the right protocol is. When there's a tiny robot with its bright little eyes going around just looking happy everywhere, um, it really opens you up for conversation. We've got some friends here, look. <laughs> Hiya. When I saw her for the first time, I remember thinking, this is gonna change things. This is one of those points where if this was a book, this would be the cliffhanger. I have a condition called Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. Um, which means that I have a lot of dislocations, there's a lot of pain um, and a lot of seizures and whatnot. So I can end up um, on my own in my room uh, for long periods of time. Uh, a lot of the time um, with a condition like my own, of course there's the pain. And the pain is bad, and the dislocations are bad, and the seizures and being in paralysis and never knowing whether you're going to be able to wake up properly tomorrow, that's bad. But what's worse still is being able to count the number of people you see a day on one hand. Are you ready? Sure am, I'm just hoping the connection's going to stay. Yeah, Ricky. Alright, here we go. When you're used to just the same little metre by metre and a half window every day and you've been there for months, being able to just see the sky from somewhere else or the tops of trees or a sign is incredible. Or being able to have that kind of chat in the car that most people will probably take for granted. I'm going to go past Grandma and Grandad so you can give them a wave. Now, if Jade was particularly seizure she she um, can still take part. Um, and that's brilliant, really, because before she would just be left um, in, in a bed or in the house with just her carers. It's quite a small world, that. Right, so there's one of them. Uh, here, this, this costume I'm busy making at the moment. When I'm not on bed rest and I'm not just um, wearing pyjamas all the time, um, I enjoy uh, being able to dress as different characters and go to comic cons and that kind of thing. Um, because it just lets me show a different side of myself um, and it's a, it's a bit of fun. If you can't go out that often, you've got to enjoy it when you do. <laughs> Does that? No, it's good. <laughs> it's one of those weird things where I want to not have to use B because I want to be well enough to be able to go to those places myself. Like, it really makes a big difference to me to be able to go into school. But the thing is, with my condition fluctuating all of the time, I can't go into school reliably. still a few little things that we need to work out but for the most part I think it's gone fairly well um, and it's brilliant because I can really tell the difference between today and yesterday um, how yesterday I forced myself to go into school when I wasn't very well and I was really tired afterwards and ended up having loads of seizures whereas today I've been able to do all of the work I've been able to keep a clear head and not be ill which means I'm able to be more focused on my schoolwork so there is my first step of working, is to simplify Route 8. The algebra test is next week. Now I'm 
now I'm trying to make friendships which I'll be able to maintain with B. Before that, I end up letting people down quite often. B gives me hope, yeah. She's just always there. And if I can't do something, she can. And if I need sort of assistance to be able to make commitments, then she's there and she means that I feel like a more valuable person because I'm more reliable. debuted, the 4G wireless we have today allowed people for the first time to hit the road and explore unknown places with only a smartphone for directions. When 5G arrives, it could enable driverless cars to take us there as well. 5G stands for 5th generation mobile networks or wireless systems. It's insanely fast and can accommodate a lot more connected devices. But the reason it's being called revolutionary is because 5G will allow connected devices to speak to each other as well as people. Right now we're living in a world where really it's it's a one-way experience. That's Bloomberg tech reporter Ian King. The network talks to your phone, you look at your phone and access data, then you send something back to the network. What we're being told about 5G is that really for the first time we're going to see machines communicating with each other over mobile networks in a meaningful way. 5G could end up being 100 times faster than what we have now, with speeds that could reach 20 gigabits per second. In plain English, that means downloading a full-length HD movie in seconds. 5G will also increase total bandwidth, which we will need in order to accommodate the growing Internet of Things. We're talking about the class of devices like internet-connected refrigerators, thermostats, dog collars, but 5G will enable many, many more. Things like your utility, 
network factories where machines are just sat there, not connected at all. Suddenly we're, they're all going to be connected. Suddenly we're going to be able to have real-time monitoring. Other things like cars, like you know, utility poles, like your light, you know, the, the light poles. But perhaps the biggest advance will be a huge reduction in communication lag time, known as latency. A network of driverless cars will need the speed of 5G to ping each other multiple times per second to avoid collisions. Near instantaneous data transfers could allow doctors to perform surgery remotely with a robotic scalpel. So how will all this work? First, you need to improve network density. And that's just a fancy way for saying you put more towers out there. What we're being told is that's not actually the case with 5G. The idea is 5G will not only use the existing mobile spectrum, but also tap into higher frequencies called millimeter waves. Millimeter waves can carry more data, but only travel short distances. This may mean you'll see a lot more of these base stations around town. And the new towers may have as many as 100 antenna ports, compared to about a dozen on 4G cell towers. So when will we get 5G? Getting 5G ready is expected to cost providers $275 billion over seven years in the U.S. alone. Look for the first 5G service to pop up in big cities sometime in 2019. The cubicle represents a tyranny that it confines your imagination, your thoughts, into a small physical area. Imagine pretty much every software engineer or finance person being able to you know, disconnect from their desk and look at holographic monitors on a beach and doing their work from there. That's not going to be science fiction. It's the modern office place. Silicon Valley is all about building the future. A startup called Meta thinks it's getting there first, thanks to a big bet that it's made on augmented reality. How are you? Good, thank you. Welcome to Meta. Thank you. 
call it a 360 degree office where you can spatialize your thoughts as part of your workflow for education, architecture, design, engineering, etc. People often mix up augmented reality with virtual reality. VR totally blocks your ability to see or hear the real world. AR overlays holograms onto what you already see. Meta has tried to make its version of the workspace feel familiar. You grab the hologram instead of using a controller or a mouse, and your brain already knows how to do it. In other words, we've designed an operating system that humanity has always known how to use. So you can see this eyeball, which is, by the way, photorealistic. You can see my hand is occluding the eyeball, and now the eyeball is occluding my hand, right? You see those two circles? They get small, and then they turn into this glowing white ball, and then I can move my hand around supernaturally. I can do this with two hands and rotate the thing. I can stretch it. I can throw it back right into the shelving system, and that's all you have to learn to become a modern worker. And to prove this, the employees at Meta have started to get rid of their computer monitors, trading them in for Meta's augmented reality headsets. Miron thinks that in less than a decade, we'll all be just wearing strips of glass that can project holograms. In the early 80s, everybody had computers on their desktop, but no one was using them because they had a lot of work to do. So they were still using typewriters. And at some point, the CEO took all the typewriters away and everybody was forced to use their computers. So it's very exciting to see a new generation of technology, a new paradigm. I consider us like pioneers in the holographic wild. I'm pulling up my browser with my hands and, and sending out emails to colleagues and just kind of really acclimating to the new environment. essentially. Our digital lives live on our phones. We have all of our pictures and notes and all these kinds of things. So why don't you write yourself a little sticky note? I like it. And go ahead and just take your fist right over the top of the sticky note and close your fist. And now... Oh, what? Meta's own transition to augmented reality has run into plenty of unexpected problems. And it's still going to be a while before you'll start to see these devices in your office. But I think it's a future worth waiting for. If we could see these holograms between us, we will have been able to share our work with one another more naturally, more efficiently, and more productively than ever before. Humanity will have evolved slightly.
This is Hatsune Miku, Japan's sensational virtual pop star. She's released over 100,000 songs in multiple languages and performed sold out concerts around the world. Her image has appeared in games, on TV, in car races, and is even etched on the side of a Japanese space rocket. I came from Hatsune Miku. She's Lady Gaga's favorite digital pop star and opened shows for her in the U.S. three years ago. Tens of thousands of fans attended her exhibition and live shows near Tokyo recently. She's everything to everybody. That's probably why she's so popular. Miku's creator, Hiroyuki Ito, and his Sapporo-based company have been developing the virtual diva for over 10 years. Both the software and character are named Hatsune Miku, meaning the first sound of the future. Originally based on Yamaha's Vocaloid technology, Miku the software has a sound bank containing voice samples and a huge array of tools. You input the melody and lyrics, then Miku the character sings them. To date, Krypton has sold 120,000 software licenses at $200 each to fans around the world who use it to create numerous songs and share them online. Some of the fan-created songs are chosen to be part of Miku's concerts, for which they're paid a royalty fee. The company also has other revenue streams 